We are joined today by the Controller and Auditor General Seamus McCarthy as the permanent witness to the Committee, and he is joined by Maureen Mulligan, Deputy Director of Audit. Apologies have been received from Deputy Pat Deering. Um, first item on the agenda of the Minister of the meeting of the 18th of April have been circulated. Is it agreed to publish? That is agreed. And matters arising. There will be no matters arising that won't come up under the correspondence, so we'll move on to the next item, which is correspondence received. And again, as always, there are three categories of correspondence. Category A um, relates to the briefing documents and opening statement 2149 and 2150 from the Office of the Garda Commissioner, dated the 3rd and the 7th of May, and the briefing document and opening statement for today's meeting. We uh, note and publish that. That is agreed. Correspondence item B from accounting officers and our ministers and follow-up to PAC meetings and other items for publishing. First item is number 221 from Sean O'Fallou, Secretary General, Department of Education and Skills, dated the 16th of April, providing information in relation to the arrangement for the internal audit of ETBs and steps taken by the Department to resolve any issues. Mr Fallou provides an update in relation to the internal audit arrangements of City of Dublin ETB and the ETB Internal Audit Unit. So we note and we'll publish that, and we know there have been difficulties. We're pleased now that the, the Department is starting to give this matter greater priority and attention and resources. And what I would hope is we will take this into consideration um, um, as part of our periodic report. He advises that there is an increased budget, as I have mentioned, and um, the Department is also jointly commissioning a wider review of internal audit in the sector to ascertain a longer term support required to deliver an ongoing and appropriate internal audit function. We have mentioned that there is one unit based in Cavan and there are difficulties getting people to recruit to travel the whole country. And so um, they are looking at that issue, and we do welcome that, but we will consider this um, as part of our periodic report because, as I have stated, we have not been happy with the internal audit function in the ETB sector, and it has now been addressed. Next item, correspondence, is 2122 from John McCarthy, Secretary General of the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government, providing a detailed response requested to the Committee to a number of matters um, raised at our meeting with him on the 28th of February. We can note and publish this. Now, if any member wants to comment on it, uh, please do, but we will take the contents of this into consideration in relation to finalising our report on housing issues. A lot of information has been incorporated in that report. Uh, Deputy Murphy and Deputy yeah. Cassatt, um, just one. Uh, uh, I was yeah. going to make exactly that point that I mean, there is some useful information yeah. for, for that report, um, but there was also a, uh, in the last couple of weeks, there was a uh, the amount, the cost of turnkey as yeah. opposed to direct build um, was uh, revealed as well and I think we should include that. Um, that was something that we raised here and we got an undertaking here uh, that, uh, the, the, that, that the categories of that would be separately published um, because it's, it's about a third more uh, to buy a turnkey as opposed to a direct build on average. And, um, and given the scale of the housing crisis, the direct build would, would certainly be um, uh, would, would certainly be a, a big uh, a part of the of the solution. Uh, can I just ask about how we intend to go about publishing that report? Because that report was to be a dual report in relation to the national broadband plan, and it was to be a report on the work that we've done on housing. We had hearings in relation to both. Um, uh, and I realise that there's, uh, you know, that, that uh, the, there has been an announcement. Uh, I've got to say, I know we had a meeting scheduled for yesterday to look at the draft. Um, that um, the committee decided on the majority not not to go ahead with. Um, I'd like to know what we were going to proceed on that because I think there's uh, a valuable contribution. Um, to be made in the work that we have done, um, and uh, particularly in the area of the forerunner demands, um, and I, I, where the draft is, is you know a start. I think there are significant gaps 
uh, that, we, that we need to address. So we will have to meet and we'll have to go through the gaps in that. But is it intended to publish the housing report separately? Is it intended to do it as a dual uh, um, report? Or, or, or what, what will we decide to do? What is the plan of action? Okay, the, the situation we had a schedule, just for the public record, we had a scheduled meeting yesterday in private discussion, or in private session, um, to schedule to take place to discuss a document produced by the Secretariat in relation to the broadband and the metropolitan area network and separately one on the housing as a result of the various meetings we've held in recent months. Um, and the idea, the timescale would have been quite tight to discuss it yesterday, to sign, finalise it today after a meeting with the Garda Siakana. Uh, with a view to getting absolute clearance so for publication next week. I always took the view we couldn't publish it within 48 hours of the local and European elections. The week of an election, it was always going to be tight squeezed to get it out eight days in advance, the middle of next week. But when the government announced its intention to appoint a preferred bidder for the national broadband, and we can now see it is a very highly charged political debate between government and opposition, I felt just in the week of that happening, I felt for the PAC to wade in to try and discuss and finalise a report on broadband, I felt it might be perceived as the PAC wading in in a, a current um, political controversy. And I took the view, I don't want the PAC to be accused of that. We mightn't have got agreement in any event because there are different views between the government members and opposition members. And I felt the most prudent thing to do was just hold that over. I've certainly we're going to complete our work, but I just felt in the political charge debate, uh, uh, going on at these two days, I didn't want to involve the PAC just at this immediate time, but certainly we're going to complete our work as soon as practical. That was, and I, I felt as chairman uh, to better not proceed. We've, uh, the secretary phoned around, and the majority, two thirds of the committee, agreed to postpone. So we are coming back to it. But uh, Deputy Cassells wants to get in, and we'll finish our conversation on this issue. Deputy Cassells, probably on the housing issue, yeah, there's so. information. And I also felt, with the information that came out on Tuesday, a lot of it may have been relevant to incorporate in a report, which we wouldn't have been able to sign off you know, within 24 or 48 hours of all that document coming available. So I felt the prudent thing was just let the political side of it get out of the way and the PAC will do its work as there's always does outside of the current political controversy. I'll come back to Deputy, but Deputy Cassells has indicated. Okay, okay, thanks. <coughs> Chairman, I, want I to understand, and sorry, and I acknowledge <coughs> publicly uh, Deputy Murphy uh, was keen that the meeting should have proceeded as scheduled, and I accept that, but the members, the majority took the opposite view, and I accept a lot of work had been done in relation to the <coughs> metropolitan area network, which was a significant part of the work prepared by the Secretary, but because it was connected with the broadband in the one report, I felt we couldn't go into that report in this political. And the idea was, subject to the agreement of the committee, that we would actually just publish two reports simultaneously on the one day, one on housing and one, but in the one launch, but maybe not, not two chapters. So are talking about doing the housing one? It's, as soon as practical. And we've got information here today that's relevant as well. Like what timeline are we on that? Well, I'll ask, that's up to the members, but I don't think we can produce it and publish it um, be, before the local and European elections. Like, to publish a report next week, we would have to have absolute sign-off today. And I think that time is very, very tight. And I, as chairman, would not recommend we publish a report from the PAC in relation to housing and broadband in the week of the election. So I just think, you know, it was a tight, ambitious go, go, Government, uh, I'm sure, appreciate the timing. Well, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but look at we, we, they, we, they hadn't a problem with yeah, it. But we, we'll, be, we, we'll, we'll be coming back to it. We just felt to hold off. Just to, I just felt it was prudent for the PAC to maintain its political independence at this time and not wade into the debate. Deputy Cassells, just briefly. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Chairman. I want to focus on the, the correspondence from Mr McCarthy yeah. uh, that came in. Uh, again, it kind of highlights the frustration because there is as much in that follow-up note that could spark a whole fresh debate here uh, than there was in the whole original debate. In fact, even more uh, than the original documentation. Uh, and it, it, it gives rise, and I appreciate that you said, you know, a report will be issued. But there's as much in that in terms of actually what would feed into a, a fresh debate. In particular, 
on those graphs there in respect of the LPT take uh, feeding into the housing. I know it's a point that myself. Which page? Are you referring to a particular page? It, there's a graph down, if you go down in terms of it's a chart on the local authorities. On the LPT take, it's a point okay. that myself and Deputy Murphy have consistently made as well in terms of the contribution in towards uh, the housing aspect. It, it, in terms of the failure, in terms of the mortgage to rent scheme, my own county there mentioned traveller accommodation. There's a whole plethora of things there uh, th that, could be, that could be examined. Um, I know I raised points that day as well uh, with the SEC Gen in respect of the local property tax take and uh, the fact that the government and the Taoiseach in particular, the Taoiseach has made a particular pledge uh, that all property tax now will be retained locally so that no councils who at the moment uh, are running a surplus and contribute to the ex equalisation fund will no longer have to do so. And when I asked the Secretary General that on the day, he had no idea how that would be achieved. And we're talking serious money here in that respect. Uh, and for the, 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 the office holder of the, of the pr most prominent office in the country to say that we'd achieve that, and the Secretary General couldn't answer how we would do that, and that hasn't been addressed. Um, you know, raises serious issues. And since then, there's been political promises made uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of local election manifestos that all uh, councils under Fine Gael would actually cut the property tax. So, I mean, when we examine these documents uh, that have been brought forward here this morning, uh, we see the strain uh, that certain uh, departments and councils are under, even in achieving, and their failure to achieve what the, that they should be doing. I'm telling you, this document raises even more questions. We could have a whole fresh round of debates uh, on it, Chairman. Uh, and I look forward to using this in terms of, of, of your compilation and this committee's compilation of that report. Okay, thank you. Um, Deputy Cunnan, on this general issue. Yeah. The two issues, yeah, just on the, the housing report first. Um, I don't think we should be too precious about timing around elections, mm. because I don't think, I don't think our report was obviously it wasn't planned in, in that way, so the timing yeah. is coincidental that we have an election. Having said that, I think we're not ready to publish it anyway. Um, so we, we have to do, is it one more sitting to clear the housing report or is it? No, we've had no discussion on it at all at yet. All? Okay. We haven't had even the first preliminary I think we just need a timeline then around yeah. when we're going to discuss it. So yeah. it, most likely because of that, it will be after the local elections yeah. um, anyway, because, yeah. simply because we haven't done our work yet on it. In relation to the broadband um, report, um, and for, for a number of reasons I think it was right not to proceed with the meeting yesterday. Obviously we have the letter from Robert Watt, the memo that was published yesterday. So how do we intend then to deal with that in the context of our report? Because our report essentially is unfinished business, given we now have this letter that was published in relation to Robert Watt. I know it deals with a lot of other issues, but um, we have a number of options. We proceed with our report as is and deal with that letter separately, or we deal with that letter and the questions that it raises as part of an ongoing process, um, and maybe incorporate then our examination of his concerns into our report. Um, and I'm just looking for your guidance on okay, my, my how view, you feel is best to proceed okay, with that. My view on that issue, we had uh, Mr Watt in here talking about um, uh, capital projects a couple of weeks ago. And we listed all of the ones, starting with the Children's Hospital, and we went down, I think, through the ten major ones in public session. And we came and had a discussion with Mr. Watt in public session in respect of this national broadband plan. And, and maybe it was yourself, Deputy, somebody asked him, did he think it should go ahead? And he actually said in public, it was more than his job was worth to answer that question in public. So clearly he'd indicate it publicly. So now, as a result of the discussion we have had in relation to capital projects and specifically on this, Obviously, we're writing to Mr. Watt now for an unredacted version of all correspondence um, because we have already previously have discussed that particular matter here, and I think an unredacted version, uh, the PSE will formally request that, I think, as a result of the day today. And when we get that, um, I think then we'll decide the next step. But obviously, there was information that he felt he didn't want to share on the day, um, uh, and I think now there might be an opportunity for a full discussion on the information that he couldn't share on the day now that a lot has been published in the mean. I would suggest that, and that information then can be incorporated into... I just add one point to it, because yeah. it's, it's very rare, in fact, and I think it's, it's something to be welcomed, that we get 
these type of memos and these type of reports good. published. Yeah. So it's good that there is robust engagement good. between that department and other departments and then the response back from the Secretary General of the Department of Communications as well. So I think it's a welcome development. But given that it very rarely happened, and I think the CNAG in fact had called for this type of reporting and these type of issues to be published in advance of major projects being completed, because obviously then when you have all the information, the government will decide based on the information they have, what's the best course of action once they have all of the information. But given that it hasn't happened, it's the first time I've seen a letter of that uh, 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 language that's so stark in terms of its critique of, of a project that at that point hadn't been signed off on. It's new to the PEC. So how do we examine it as a, as a committee? Because okay. it, it, is in, you know, it is a political decision that was made at cabinet level, yeah. but at the same time, he raised fundamental questions about value for money. Yeah. And value for money is exactly what we, do. What, what we do. And we normally do a look back. Obviously, the CNAG does his look back, but yeah. we as a committee normally look back. Now we're in a live situation. And given that the letter was so stark yeah. and so clear in his concerns about the project, yeah. I, I think we need to look at, in, in, in a way maybe we haven't before, how do we deal with it? Because we haven't had this type of... Robust. robust letter from a sec Secretary good, General. Before. Yeah, I, share, I share the Deputy's concern, our, our views, I concur with your views, it's good to see this mm. and it's nice to know everybody are, don't all sing off the one hymn sheet and it's good to see one line department challenging another line department and I think that's useful and, and it's good uh, that this should be published. Um, I, I do think that um, that correspondence you know, is very important and we will want to see correspondence from the Department of Communications if they have further correspondence that hasn't been issued. Um, and I think it will inform our consideration. The one point I do want to make, in case people ask, why are the PC, PAC, which normally looks back, uh, looking forward to a contract? The reason, and I'm putting it on the public record, is there's been significant expenditure incurred in relation to this project in recent years. So the National Broadband Plan the cost of tendering, the cost of the consultants, the, the cost benefits analysis report, the first draft of the the first draft of the plan, the revised draft of the plan when the EU forced the government to remove the 300,000 houses that Airgrid uh, said they or that Air yeah. said they would do, has had implications and there have been further expenditure. So we are looking at the expenditure that has been incurred to date. And we want to see is what is being done today going to achieve value for money. Uh, so we're looking at where the process has been up to now, and obviously uh, that has implications for future taxation expenditure. Where we're absolutely within a remit to look at all aspects in relation to expenditure incurred in previous uh, previous years in relation to this plan, lest somebody doubt why we're going there. Deputy Connolly, just we'll come back to each of you. Yeah, yeah, Deputy Connolly, that's been said, Chair, and I, w I was one of those that agreed for the meeting to be deferred partly for selfish, not selfish, but I had a personal, I was yeah. attending a funeral. But I didn't, I didn't agree to have been deferred for political reasons. Okay. I think that would be wrong, and okay. I think you're doing yourself an injustice, and it would be a very wrong precedent. The meeting was scheduled for yesterday. I agree that it should be deferred, as I said, for t yeah, two reasons. Only... But the other reason, which is also important, we didn't have enough information, and information was coming out. Yeah. I also felt that we couldn't complete those reports yesterday. They, they were unfinished. There are many aspects, particularly the broadband, both of them. Yeah. And we need to look at them and go back to them. And, and so I, I think the wrong message is going okay. out. Just chair, I take, fair, I take in, fa point. in fairness take to you, I don't think we should ever, ever cancel a meeting for political reasons mm -hmm. or for the perception or that it might look wrong. Quite the contrary, actually. Yeah. That's the very day that we should go ahead with the meeting. But, but it was for other reasons, practical reasons yeah. on the ground. We couldn't complete it. Uh, and we do need more information, and it's an extremely serious matter of broadband. And the um, fairness to Deputy Murphy, who asked for it to go on the agenda, we learned an enormous amount from it that's not reflected in the report. The rep so anyway, the report is a working document okay. that needs to be changed. Okay, and Deputy, yeah. I take your point clearly. It wasn't yeah. political reasons, but yeah. the volume of information that came out in the last 24... 24 hours, I felt for us to produce the report, knowing the information, yes. we needed to assess that before we could sign up. So, so you're correct, it wasn't for political reasons. Well, it was certainly it wasn't. Just, yeah, I think that, I, I think that, yeah, I, think yeah, I take your point completely. Yeah, we've I said it, point. yeah. I, I think there's a degree of revisionism given that the, the, the doll had to be post, uh, had to be adjourned yeah. for a while because the, the data only came in at two yeah. o'clock. Okay. Um, but, yeah. uh, but anyway, um, um, 
like, don't to labour that point. Um, now that we, I mean, and I, I do think the aspects around the man's is very important because it gives some sort of an insight into, into the cost of broadband. Um, and the analysis Mason report uh, obviously was very helpful from that point of view, the lack of transparency. There was a whole lot of things like that that are really important in terms of informing how you go into the future. And that is a look back. Um, um, the, so so I, 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 in terms of completing that report, there is obviously going to be a debate, we heard that when they were in that, the last day, there is going to be a debate over some considerable period of time around the contract. So I think in terms of the Public Accounts Committee being helpful, I think the meeting with uh, the SecGen uh, should predate uh, the publication of of the report, okay. So we're likely to be deferring that, and and then we have some something additional to go into that report, which I think is important as you and is useful. I think we might revisit the capital projects because he does refer to the National Children's Hospital, and there is some insights in the documentation that have, has been published that may well be helpful in terms of other advices that might have been uh, that might ha have been given in relation to that, or perhaps other contracts like roads. Exactly, roads are, are more predictable, um, uh, and uh, they, local authorities who lead the development of that very often have uh, fine-tuned the, um, uh, the work on those. The, the other thing is that uh, the point that Deputy Cassells makes in relation to the local property tax, there's a real, uh, the, the more complicated you make something, the more you, you get away with it. Um, and the local property tax is just so confused. Not the local property tax, local government funding is so confusing that it, um, that there's, that, that, you know, the government on the last, in the last general election said about not introducing any new taxes. And there was no uh, new, uh, there was no new uh, income taxes introduced. But there is things within this that I think are, um, are, are really, uh, that really should be a cause of concern. I don't think when local property tax was introduced, there was an expectation that it would fund uh, housing or roads. Um, it wasn't sold as such. And the point that's been made in relation to it being a local property tax and, and wholly uh, being retained in, in one particular area and not being a replacement for, subs, uh, for, for a subvention that comes for projects from central government. Um, we have now got a budget and oversight committee. Um, and we were told that the purpose of that budget and oversight committee was that where things are proposed and it's uh, and, and, and where the and usually I, I think I think that the point was being made in relation to the opposition that if the opposition are making uh, demands for things and indeed your own party have been criticised uh, by Fine Gael quite heavily on this um, uh, where where you're making demands for things to be done that that budget and oversight committee would have a responsibility to look at it to see if it's if it's possible now why don't we ask the budget and oversight committee to have a look at what the cost would be of making this a wholly local um, property tax um, as opposed to um, a, as opposed to a replacement for uh, for uh, you know the grants that would be coming from various government departments um, and, and I, I think that that would be a valuable uh, piece of work that would be an ongoing piece of work for that particular committee like we we did our own budget as as uh, i know we're leaving our politics outside the door when we come in here but we did our own, our own budget um as as others others do in advance of of of, of the, the budget being announced and we included uh, an amount for precisely that but it's only when you go looking at it you realize how costly it is so i think we should we should do that um, we should ask the Budget and Oversight Committee to specifically look at um, the local property tax and if you were to make it wholly local um, and not have an equalisation fund, what would that cost be? And what would, um, looking at the, uh, the self-fund aspect, which is about um, councils funding roads and housing, which was not what the public expected in relation to local property tax, um, in, would, 
we, we could ask them to include looking at, uh, at, at that particular aspect. If you took that aspect out, what would be the dynamic uh, okay. in relation to that? And just the answer, Captain. Yeah. He's promised it already. He must have the answer. Okay. So, so, so can, can the committee agree to make that request of the Budget Oversight Committee that they would examine this matter? Can, yes. we, can we all agree? Because what and chairman on that, because this... this no, other sorry, yeah, on, sorry, sorry, sorry. And, and just the other point to make, I think we should plough ahead with the housing yes. report. Yeah. And we should get that uh, finished and done I as soon as possible, so as that we then only have, we, we have one thing cleared. Okay, thank you. And Deputy Cassell. Just a quick point. And I'm telling you, it frustrates, this topic frustrates me because spend a, we should spend a month on it because the, we, spend, we do it maybe once a year. The CNA Genius Report always says that the myriad of funding on into local government, you know, and in and out of here in half a day, we should spend a whole month on it because it was one of the most, it has the biggest impact on local people's lives, bar none. And that aspect about the self funding aspect for housing and roads was a huge sleight of hand that the ordinary person wouldn't have understood in the context of aspects of local government that was previously funded through a central fund from the Customs House was now being, uh, counties like Meath and Kildare and Dublin were now having to fund this themselves out of people's local property tax as opposed to coming to a central fund. That was a huge thing and the impact of that, Chairman, as the impact of that is of course that means there's less money to spend on some other aspect of local services. So people ask the question, where is my local property tax going? But suddenly, these monies are being used to fund what had previously been funded by a central government fund. There's the sleight of hand, Chairman. They're the kind of things that need to come out into the public domain so that people can understand the significance of what is being done in the Department of Local Government and the impact it's having on local services and how you square the circle in promising people that there'll be no increase in their property tax, we're actually going to re reduce their property tax, and uh, counties like Dublin and Meath can retain all their property tax, but will somehow find the money to fund Leitrim and Longford as well. It's, it's so voodoo we'll, mathematics. We'll ask the Secretary to put a letter together <coughs> to the Budget and Oversight Committee covering the points that have been raised, and we'll ask them to examine that, OK? Grant. OK, yeah, thank you. You should come in and ask us as well, because that would be fun. <laughs> we'll do that in budget day after the budget. That'll be budget day matter. OK, next item then is item... Um, so we'll note and publish um, that documentation and incorporate it into a report on housing. Next item is 2123 from Martin Fraser, Secretary General, Department of Antiship, dated 17th of April, regarding our request for details regarding the whole of government approach to risk assessment. So we'll note and publish that document. Uh, yeah. yeah. We publish all our promises for the yeah. local governments. Okay, very good. I hope they're well costed now, you know. Um, next item, 2124. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Give it a half an hour. Um, 2124 for, um, the, from uh, Mr. Dennis Breen, Department of Antishuk, pointing out that the Department sees an inaccuracy in periodic report number five in relation to the filing date for the appropriation accounts 2016 for the President's establishment. Our report states that we drew attention to the fact that the appropriation account was filed in September 2017 and I have the vote number one 2016 in front of me here and the issue was it was the statement of internal financial control was signed on the 14th of September but the actual appropriation account had been submitted it to the CNAG um, had been submitted to the CNAG by the end of March within the time. So we're happy to note and put that on the record. Yep. And what I will say is when we get a report back from deeper in relation to our periodic report, we'll reconfirm the matter at that stage. Okay? And we, we'll, we'll discuss it again. I'm delighted to see every line we write is um, scrutinised so closely. I'm impressed. So that's good. And we will come back to it as part of our assessment of the response from deeper. Okay, next item was... Um, next item, there are three items related to our inquiries in relation to um, the ongoing review of matters in Waterford Institute of Technology. 2125 from William Bosang, the Department of Education and Skills, gives an update by the committee on the, need, on the next steps in relation to the independent review of the spin-out and sale of companies from telecommunication software systems group at Waterford IT, which was not completed for legal reasons relating to the remit of the Higher Education Authority. The Department is prepared to examine issues by the contributors to the HEA report if contributors give their permission to forward the information to the Department. In parallel, the Department is continuing to examine the matters in the CNAG special report on the development and disposal of intellectual property in Feed Henry 
in Waterford, I T, which has raised a number of questions, which did raise a number of questions regarding WIT's governing body. And Mr. Bosang advised the Department will keep the committee uh, updated when there are further developments. Correspondence 2140, as I said, there's three related to this topic, is from Stephanie Good, Department of Education and Skills, confirming that the Department has received responses mentioned in the last item from the governing body of Waterford Institute of Technology to the questions posed uh, by the Department. Ms. Good advised that the responses are currently under active consideration by officials in the Department, and so we can note and publish this. That, that's agreed. And then also related is 2136 from Paula O'Toole, Chief Executive Officer, the Higher Education Authority, in relation to its draft report on WIT um, regarding the development and disposal of intellectual property in Food Henry. The HEA previously advised the committee that it was unable to complete the review as it did not have the legal powers to do so. Separately, the HEA did not agree to release the draft report to the Right to Know group following an FOI request. Mr. Tool advised that the decision was partially overturned by the Information Commissioner on appeal. That's good. Somebody was doing their job. The Information Commissioner determined that Chapters 1 to 4 of the draft should be released. Mr. Tool enclosed a copy of this document for the information of the committee. He does draw our attention to the possible legal difficulties if the Right to Know group or others, such as this committee, publishes um, this item. I would propose, therefore, that we publish Mr. Tool's letter, but we do not publish uh, the related document at this time. So we might get agreement to that, but Deputy Cunningham wants to speak on these items. Yeah, I, agree, I agree with that recommendation. Uh, just in relation to Mr Bosang's letter, first of all, I welcome the fact that he responded to um, our concerns in our letter. Uh, we ended up in a situation where we had that draft report that we got redacted. All of the conclusions, obviously, uh, were, were left out. So essentially what we got was the context, uh, the terms of reference and so on. <coughs> we didn't get any of the conclusions or recommendations that would have came or formed part of that report. Uh, what we now have though in the letter from Mr Bosang is that they may follow through with some form of examination of this issue themselves and he sets out the power that the department has and the minister has. So essentially my reading of what he is saying is that they haven't concluded yet or they haven't settled on what their course of action is but they will make some recommendation to the Minister, which may well be to appoint under the, the Act a special investigator to investigate the claims. There is a bit of a worry though where they say they'll go back to the whistleblowers that came forward and people who made protected disclosures, which is fair enough, but that one of the things they will advise is that they can go through the normal procedures in WIT to make protected disclosures. Um, I think the horse has bolted pretty much on that one. I've no difficulty in them setting that out as an option but they've already made protected disclosures to the HEA. We have to protect the integrity of the process here as well. If people have come forward, have made protected disclosures to a state body and then are told, no, go back to your institute, um, I think there's a bit of a concern about that. Now, they set it out as an option. They also say that the individuals can also resubmit their disclosures to the department, and that will in turn inform whether the department then advise the Minister to appoint a special investigator. But it seems an awful lot of responsibility has been put back on the whistleblowers and on people who made disclosures. Um, and there, I would assume they're all busy people, firstly, but also there are people who are concerned, as you know, some of them have been in contact with me, and they're just concerned that they were left hanging. So, you know, we they may well then decide, well, we're not going to follow through on this or not. I, we don't know. We can, you know, or they may well. But I think it's it's... I'm a little bit unsettled by the fact that they're put, they seem to be putting an awful lot of uh, onus on what the whistleblowers do and what those who made disclosures do, rather than following through themselves. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, there should be. I, I would recommend that this committee recommends to them that they proceed with appointing an investigator. Um, that's, we, we wanted a report. The, the issue, that, the concern we had was that the HEA did a report that's outside the scope of its powers, and that's acknowledged, and the Attorney General has acknowledged that. But they also, the Department sets out, they have the power under the Act. And, and by the way, none of this ever examined the activities of the private company, what the private company did. It was at all times the activities of the Institute and the interaction between the institute and the private company. So that's what Mr McLoon was looking at, and it was what the CNAG looked at, and it was what we did in all our hearings. So my recommendation is that we strongly recommend to them 
that that's what they do. I know they're looking for responses or waiting for responses from WIT, but that's in response to. They have received it, and they're received considering. It. They're considering the. But, uh, but they were in response to Europe. That was in response to your report. There were questions that um, arose from, from, from your report. From my report and, yeah. and they do separate them out. In fairness to Mr. Bosang and the letter, they do accept that the CNAG's report was a very narrow focus and that the McLoone report was a much wider review. So, notwithstanding whatever responses they get back in response to the CNAG's report, the other issues. Uh, stand. And just the final thing I'll say is that one of the last things that Mr Love said to us when he was here is that the facts are not in question. What was established in his view by Mr McLoon you know, were, were factual. Uh, the problem is they couldn't publish the report because it was outside the scope and the powers. So if the facts haven't changed, then they needed some, it needs, some mechanism needs to, to uh, ensure that those facts are put on the public record. Yeah. And I think appointing the investigator at this point is probably the only way to do that. Okay. And Deputy Murphy? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, and I, I, one of the things that, I mean, we all are saying that whistleblowers are valuable and important, and I completely accept that. But they have to see that there is a follow-through and that it doesn't fall back on them. We can't be in a situation where we actually do something and then people say, well, sure, what was the point? Um, and I, I actually think the, the same is, is probably felt in, in Limerick. Um, uh, now, I know it's a separate issue, um, but, the, I mean, obviously there's a the whole area of the HEA and the powers, and I think we drew attention to that, to the Department of Education, where the department is supposed to come back to us in relation to, to that particular aspect, or have I got a flawed memory on that? Like Limerick or what? Uh, I'm talking about the, the, the powers of the HEA. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but they're, look, they're, they're looking at... I, I think that what Deputy Conlan is suggesting, look, we have so much going on here. Even if we go through the whole process, the only possible good outcome at the end of it is the department or the minister appoint the inspector. Yeah. So why not do it now? Because mm -hmm. we, we can go around in circles find the, the Watson, the authority for the HEA to commission the report, to come to that conclusion. The, as you say, the people who made their disclosures are being swinging in the wind. And at some fine day, somebody either hopes the thing will go away or else the minister should appoint um, somebody. So are we recommending to the I would department? Recommend it. I would also yeah. say that I think that benefits everybody. Yeah, I think Bring that will benefit the research institutes, the governing body, yeah. uh, the president, and all of those who came forward and right. because and, and to stress this again you know there was about 50 people engaged but there were different opinions okay. that were expressed as part of that engagement okay. different views on, on what was happening within the institute so i think for everybody's benefit it's good it would be good we get the facts out there and this right. is not left hanging so i think i, I would strongly recommend that we would okay. push can, them can, on can we get agreement just pipe. so yes. everybody understands the HEA commissioned a report into Waterford Institute of Technology. The report was completed, then there were issues, and at the very end of the day it transpired the HEA may not have had the legal authority um, to, to, to commission the particular investigation. Such authority was only vested with the department and the minister to carry out such an investigation. And in the meantime, all those who contributed to the report have given their thing, information out there. Uh, it's out there. They're known. The 50 people who contributed in a confidential, on a confidential basis are swinging in the wind because they have no recourse now as a result of everything they said, and they're still employed in the, in, in the organisation. And the department has confirmed the only people who absolutely have the power to commission uh, 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 the investigation is the actual minister. And it's going to boil down that to the end. The department have made that perfectly clear that they do have the power. So can we get agreement that we would write to the department at this point in time um, asking them to move um, to, to um, appoint an investigator under whatever section of the legislation the minister so that we get that clarified, just a technical matter in relation to what section the minister can appoint an inspector. Is it an inspector or investigator? I'm not investigator. sure. Investigator. An investigator. I think at this stage, because this is going on and on now a couple of years at this stage, and it will continue to go on, and they can wrap up those other things as they go along, and what's done may or may not be able to feed into this new situation, but I think yeah. at this stage, it is the only way of bringing the matter yeah. to a conclusion. Okay. So that, is that agreed? Yeah, yes. that's agreed. Okay, that's agreed. Thank you. Just pointed at the matter. Yeah, and we did, we did say earlier, we're not publishing that report that was received here. 
in case of prejudice as anything, or we attach parliamentary privilege to a particular document. So that's not being published after attached correspondence. So, and we've agreed that. Next item, I think, is 212128 from Martin O'Brien, Chief Executive of Me DTB, providing an update on the invoice read dis direction fraud which we have been monitoring. Mr O'Brien advises that ETB insurers, Irish public bodies, are covering the loss in full and that no loss is therefore incurred, well, incurred by the ETB. Um, ultimately, the Irish public bodies receive their funding from local authorities and ETB. So all the funds that the ITB pay out comes in terms of premiums paid by public bodies fully funded by the Irish taxpayer. So as coming out to... Uh, their bank accounts rather than the, the Lout Meat ETB. So I just want to make that point. It's, a, uh, it's not a private insurance company coughing up, it's a public. I know it's a private company, but I think the point is now well made. So look at, he has asked us for patience until the matter is brought to conclusion, and we'll note and publish this correspondence in the meantime. Next item 2129 from Mark Griffin, Secretary General, Department of Communications Action. Climate Action and Environment, providing follow-up information in relation to the Metropolitan Area Networks and the National Broadband Plan, which we've discussed, and we will incorporate all this information into um, our report as soon as possible when we come back to dealing with the, our report on broadband, which also specifically uh, deals with the Metropolitan Area Network issue as well. So we note and publish that. Correspondence 2130 from D4, Director General of RT, providing an update regarding uh, the review of the 157 contractors highlighted as high or medium risk as having attributes akin to employment. This has been a recommendation of the Evershed's report. Mrs Forbes expects the review to be completed in the second half of this year and advises that RT has developed a revised policy guideline regarding the engagement of contractors from now on. Uh, Ms Forbes has committed to keeping the committee updated. Uh, we will note and publish this, but Deputy Cullinan may want to speak. Uh, yes, first of all, this came, as you know, from our own deliberations um, on this issue. And uh, the examination uh, in, into the Evershed's report um, said there may be issues of bogus self-employment, but that RTE had to meet with the individuals involved. It's only now, I think last week, that they've begun the process of meeting with some of those staff members. So they're very frustrated that it has taken so long even for that engagement to happen. But it does raise a number of issues because uh, we had a number of Secretary Generals at departments, I think it was actually the Secretary General for Communications that was here, that acknowledged that the practice of bogus self-employment is illegal. There's also taxation issues. So they haven't been addressed here as well. So I think it does need to be established in a very public way because what's happening here is, yes, they're meeting the staff and, yes, there may be arrangements or conclusions reached with staff members to put them now on their appropriate contracts. But if it was the case that RTE were very intentionally and deliberately uh, putting people on these contracts, which was engaging in the process of bogus self-employment. That's very serious for that organisation. And I think that, uh, th given that we commenced this process, uh, I think we need to follow through on it. So I think we need to go back to them to establish um, whether or not now they accept that there was people on bogus self-employment contracts. Uh, Two, are there taxation issues? Have they been in contact with revenue or will they be in contact with uh, revenue? And will there be full disclosure following all of the uh, meetings they do with all the individuals? Will there be full disclosure in relation to whether or not this was happening in RTE and to what scale and to what, um, to, to, to what extent? Um, because I do think it raises all of those issues. It's, a, it's an ongoing issue, as you know, in a number of sectors. It's a growing problem. Um, and if it's illegal, it's illegal. If there's tax issues, they have to be dealt with. Um, and uh, it doesn't establish, none of that's established in the letter. Okay. So what I think we need to write back to RT, acknowledge, RT acknowledging this, they had the timeline the end of June, which they now say they won't meet. It'll be the second half of 2019. And we specifically want the issues Deputy Cullinan has put on the record there to be incorporated in the review. There's no point in doing a little review and not dealing with the issues that you've raised. So we want that included in the review to be completed this year. Yeah. That's all we can suggest. Well, sorry, just, yeah. sorry, but, yeah. you can, but they could accept on a, 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 a non-prejudice yeah. basis prejudice. that there was an issue and just move people's contracts yeah. uh, and then sidestep the fact that this was potentially done intentionally right. um, okay. and whether or not that there was a practice within RTE to have people on bogus self-employment contracts. And if that was the case, one, it's illegal, 
Two, there's taxation issues and revenue revenue issues. So, so uh, I, I'm I'm saying that I think we should be alerting them to their responsibilities, yeah. as outlined by the department uh, uh, secretary general, that there are legal issues here and there's taxation issues. Okay. And are they aware of those? And what are they doing to address those? Okay. The deputy has covered the points very well, and we will ensure the transcript of what you've been saying is sent with the letter, so they know precisely. You know um, precisely the points you've made here in public session, in case um, they, they, they don't all get fully incorporated into a short letter. So the transcript of what you said will be sent to them to deal with. Yeah, okay. just in relation to, I mean, I think we've got to we've got to keep this under review. Uh, the second half of this year, um, we, we we should be asking them for to keep to keep us updated with progress on this. But the other thing that strikes me. Um, uh, as, as important is, uh, I would have thought that this would have been picked up by the auditors, you know, uh, and like we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't have to do things that that should naturally be picked up. Do we know who their auditors are? Um, not uh, CNAG. No, no. But it's we, not. we had their annual financial statements here as part of their meeting, yeah. and it's an, one of the major companies. Well, would that be something that would? Not, not really. Um, not. The audit is focused on the financial statements right. and the correctness of the, the financial statements. Do they represent the, the charges and income and, and so on? It wouldn't be usual that you would do um, an in-depth uh, taxation review of an individual employee's contract. Well, Revenue uh, did do a review okay. into consultants, if you remember. Me, yeah, and, 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 and there obviously is an obligation yeah. on an organisation yeah. to ensure that they are compliant with tax law. So there should be systems in place in a big organisation to ensure that uh, those questions are asked and, and uh, that payments are tested. C can I just add to it, just so we're yeah. to protect ourselves as yeah. well? We're not saying that there was yeah. a practice, just ask. but there are, there are allegations yeah. from a number of staff members that it was deliberate and intentional. That was what led to this examination. So we want the facts established. And if the facts are established that there was a practice that was intentional, there are consequences. Absolutely. But we're not saying there was, but yeah. there needs to be a we're process the question. to get okay. to yeah. Right, at this stage, I have to be excused for 20 minutes, and I'm going to ask Deputy Connolly to take over, and I'll be back shortly. That Is that agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to correspondence item 2131B from Mr Donald McManus, CEO, Irish Council for Social Housing, dated the 15th of April, providing a breakdown requested by the Committee on All Tenancies. On All Tenancies, and in brackets, we have 29,803 housing units offered by approved housing bodies, including a clarification of the length of the tenancies, the number of tenants with tenancy for life status, those on four years, six year, and ten years, tenancy, etc. This information may inf yeah, will inform our consideration in relation to housing. Anybody want to raise anything on that? No. I, I, I personally would like to just hold that over. I asked for it. It's very interesting yeah. uh, information and, and just to digest it. Okay. Yeah. I don't, okay. So next item of correspondence is 2137B from Mr Aidan O'Driscoll, Secretary General of the Department of Justice and Equality, dated the 25th of April, providing information requested by the committee following our recent meeting. Now that's a detailed long letter. Um, does anybody want to raise any matters on that? If not, we'll note and publish. Is that agreed? Okay. Okay, moving on to correspondence item 2138B from Ms Rachel Down, CEO Karanua, dated the 25th of April, providing an up 25th of April 19, providing an update requested by the committee on the current financial position of the Residential Institution Statutory Fund Karanua. Again, if that's something that I personally would like to look at, and it's been a difficult week, so I haven't. If, if anybody else wants to read, so. Will we note and publish it and we'll come back to it? it and and come back to it. Is that agreed? Yes. Yeah, we'll hold it over to discuss it. Correspondence item 2142B, dated the 30th of April, from Mr Niall Cody, Chairman of the Revenue Commissioners, responding to a request for the Committee for information on final agreements, re-cases that were appealed and now closed. Mr Cody states that revenue cannot provide the level of detail we requested, but indicates the issues involved. Okay. Proposal is to note that item and publish it. Are you okay with that? 
Okay, moving on to correspondence item 2144B, dated the 26th of April, from the Chief Superintendent Dermot Mann of Angarda Síochána, responding to a request from the Committee for Information in relation to an examination of financial matters in Templemore, the tax treatment of the living allowances for students at the Garda College, and an update on monies owed from the neighbouring golf club in Templemore. Again, the proposal is to note and publish. And publish. No matters arising. Okay. Correspondence item 2145B, dated 1st May 19, from Mr. Robert Watt, Secretary General of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, providing a response to the committee in relation to deeper, number one, deeper guidance regarding business cases for capital expenditure products, pro projects, number two, a note regarding a PSE recommendation in relation to the property revaluation program, ICT system, sorry, in relation to the Property Revaluation Programme ICT system, and three, an update on the evaluation of the National Shared Services Office. Can we note this item and publish it? Okay. So that's the end of that category of correspondence. Moving on to category C, correspondence from and related to private individuals and any other correspondence. So item 2119C, received from the Louth Environmental Group dated the 22nd of February 19, requesting the committee to make inquiries in relation to a public infrastructure project at Belurg and Dundalk, County Louth. The group believed that the works undertaken were not fit for purpose and involved excessive costs. Okay. I don't know whether you've had a chance to read it, but I propose to request the Office of Public Works for an information note regarding the project. Is that agreed? Yeah. Agreed? Okay. Moving on to the second item in this category, uh, item 2120C from Deputy Matty McGrath, dated the 16th of April, requesting the committee to meet with the lecturer from Maynooth University regarding the proposed new Court of Appeal. This matter is a policy issue. Um, well, that's the letter. And uh, the matter, I understand, is a policy issue and not within the remit of the committee. And the proposal is to forward it to the Committee on Justice and Equality for any action that is deemed appropriate. You agreed with that? Yeah. Okay. Just for the, the, the Court of Appeal is in place. Yes. It's not a proposed Court of Appeal. Well, that, that, that's... Yeah. that's uh, Thank you for the clarification, but that's just the letter that was... Yep. Yeah. 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 Correspondence item 2126. 2126C from a medical doctor dated the 18th of April with questions for the committee regarding the National Children's Hospital. Um, we will be meeting with the hospital board next week. Can we note this item and raise it next week as appropriate? Agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Moving on to correspondence item 2127C again from Deputy Matty McGrath dated the 19th of April, requesting the committee to arrange a meeting with the health executive in relation to fees paid to private and voluntary nursing homes. Um, again, I, th I think we know that the Controller and Auditor General is working on a related report, which is expected later this year. Yes, um, and I, I will be dealing with the matter raised by Deputy McGrath in that report. Okay. Are we happy to leave it till then? Yes. Okay. yes. So we won't take any further action at this point, and that's agreed that we leave it. Okay, what are we moving on to next? Okay, we're moving on to 2132C. And this is a copy of an email sent to a number of people from an individual dated the 24th of April 2019 in relation to concerns regarding the enrolment policy of a school in Navan County Meath. Again, this matter is not within the remit of the committee. Uh, can we just note the item? Okay, note it. Correspondence item 2133C from Miss Claire Rice, dated, we're giving her name? Yeah, in, this case, yeah, yeah. in this case. From Miss Claire Rice, dated the 22nd of April, regarding the publication of her research paper on public accounts committees. Okay, well, the focus of the paper is on the committee in Northern Ireland. Uh, while it is, she has obtained information from the previous committee here, which fed into her research. So the proposal is to thank Ms Rice for sharing her research with us. And, uh, of course, we're all going to look at it and learn lessons from it, presumably. Yeah. Agreed. We'll move on to correspondence item 2134C from an individual dated the 29th of May 2018, requesting the committee to investigate any public interest issue arising from a decision of the Information Commissioner regarding an FOI request. So, 
to investigate any public interest issue. I don't know if you have had a chance to read it, but it, my note here is telling me it's not our role to adjudicate on decisions on the Information Commission, which is clearly correct, and uh, there's an appeals process available, and uh, the proposal is to write to the correspondent and advise accordingly. In agreement? In agreed. Agreed. Moving on to correspondence item 2139C, dated the 26th of April, requesting the committee to inquire about the payment of a severance package by Wexford Local Development Limited that was recommended by the Labour Court. The correspondence states that exhaustive efforts have been made to resolve this. Again, the matter is not within the remit of the committee. Is that agreed? Agreed. I'm going to just finish these two items of correspondence and maybe Deputy Kelly might take over the chair. Oh, you're the first speaker. Yes, first speaker. Okay, I'll okay, sure. continue. Yeah. Yeah. Correspondence item 2141C from an individual dated the 29th of April 2019 and he's made points in relation to recent commentary in the media regarding the Rural Ireland Action Plan. Again, it's not a matter within the remit of the committee, so I'm just noting it. Agreed? Agreed. And the final piece of correspondence, 2143C, from an individual dated the 30th of April regarding contractual arrangements in relation to a tourism starter project in Cork involving Cork City Council. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've read it, but the proposal is to advise the correspondent that the City and County Councils are not within the remit of the committee, which they're not, and he may wish to pursue the matter through the local authority audit service. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. So, moving on to statements and accounts received since the last meeting. There are four accounts and statements for review this week. Okay. okay. So, the, the first one is the Irish Museum of Modern Art with a clear audit opinion. Can we note it? Okay. Second one, Gardaí Síochána Ombudsman Commission, clear audit opinion. Can we note it? Yeah. Okay. The Heritage Council, clear audit opinion, and non-compliant procurement of 690,000. Do we know what that was? Uh, more detail given in the um, report um, or in the financial statements. I, I don't just have it um, okay. to, to hand. Okay. Do we, do you want we to can circulate it. Yeah, good okay. Okay. Yeah. And the final one is the Property Service Regulatory Authority. Again, it is a clear audit opinion. Can we note that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay. So just the work program. And there's one key change to the work program since uh, before Easter, and the Department of Agriculture has been added to the schedule for the 20th of June 2019. Uh, Okay. And so, and the final three meetings are not. There might be some rearranging in relation to these last three meetings, but we expect all three to proceed. Is that okay? Okay. Any other business? No. Thank you. Okay. We we'll suspend for a few minutes to allow the witnesses to take their seats. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
question. Uh, this morning we are meeting with Angarda Siakana in relation to the appropriation accounts of 2017 for 20 Angarda Siakana and reporting the accounts of the public service uh, 2017 chapter 7, management of overtime expenditure in Angarda Siakana. We are joined by the following uh, from Angarda Siakana, uh, Commissioner Drew Harris, uh, Mr. John Toomey, Deputy Commissioner of Police and Security, Mr. Joseph Nugent, Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Rory McGinley, Professional Accountant, Finance Section. Um, seated behind is Mr. Andrew McLendon, Director of Communications, uh, Ms. Anne Marie Staunton, Professional Accountant, Finance Section. The representative from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform is Mr. John Burke, Principal Officer. The representative from the Department of Justice and Equality is Mr. Uh, Nula Ni uh Principal Officer, Police and Division, and we also have Ak Ikri Zanui Abidin, I hope I got that right, uh, also uh, from uh, the Department. And may I take this opportunity as it's your first uh, time in front of uh, this committee, Commissioner Harris, to wish you the best in your role on behalf of this committee. And um, I jest when I say, you know, if you're not here that often, that would be a very good thing too. <laughs> Um, but uh, very best wishes from everyone here in this committee in your role. Um, can I remind uh, members, witnesses and those in the public gallery that all mobile phones must now be completely switched off. Uh, I wish to advise the witnesses but that by virtue of section 1721 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your said evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice that, uh, to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him her or it identifiable. Uh, members are reminded of the provisions within Standing Order 186 that the committee shall also refrain from inquiring into the merits of a policy or policies of the government or a minister of the government or the merits or of the objectives of such policies. Um, while we expect witnesses to answer questions asked by the committee clearly and with candour, witnesses can and should expect to be treated fairly and with respect and consideration at all times in accordance with the witness protocol. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, can we have the opening statement from the CNAG now, please? Uh, yes, uh, Chairman. Well, uh, as members will be aware, the 2017 appropriation account for the vote for Angarda Siakana recorded gross expenditure of 1.67 billion euros. As indicated in the diagram, which can be now brought on screen, almost two-thirds of the expenditure was related to payment of salaries, wages and allowances, which totaled... Uh, 1,076 million euros in 2017. On Garda Siakona spent a further 327 million euros on pension and gratuity payments to reti retired Gardaí. Apart from standard administration costs, expenditure was incurred on operational inputs including transport, communications and other operational equipment and building maintenance and servicing of stations and other buildings. Unlike other large votes, the account does not analyse spending in terms of output programmes such as traffic policing, fraud investigation or other specialist functions. At the end of 2017, around 16,200 whole-time equivalent staff were employed, of which just under 14,000 were Gardaí or trainees and 2,200 were civilian employees with Angarda Siakana. The vote for Angarda Siakana is one of the few votes that routinely receives a supplementary estimate towards the end of the year. A supplementary estimate of just over 44 million euros was voted for Angarda Siakana in 2017. At the end of the year, the amount remaining unspent was 14.2 million euros. Of this, 8.9 million euros in unspent capital funding was carried over to 2018, with the remaining 5.3 million euros liable for surrender. The accounting officer's statement on internal financial control discloses non-competitive procurement by Angarda Siakana of 28.5 million euros worth of goods and services in 2017, including a significant level of procurement which was not compliant with public procurement rules. This is a recurrent issue in Angarda Siakana. 
The statement on internal financial control also discloses significant financial and other risks faced by Angarda Siakona and the steps being taken to address those risks. Chapter 7 examined the systems in place to manage overtime spending in Angarda Siakona. In 2017, overtime payments totaled €132 million, Euros, or 12% of the overall Garda pay bill. This level of spending was up to three times the level of spending on overtime in other police forces and three and a half times the overtime cost of €38 million Euros incurred by Angarda Siakona in 2014. In addition, actual uh, expenditure exceeded the estimate provision for overtime in each of the five years to 2017. Excess spending on overtime was the main reason for the supplementary estimate in 2017. Our review found that the management practices in Angarda Siakona to control the overtime budget were ineffective. We concluded that the data recording and collation systems in use were deficient. While they record the basic information needed to authorise and to support the correctness of the overtime payments, they failed to provide the basis for the analysis required to effectively deploy staff resources, monitor use and identify potential economies and efficiencies. We also found that while some measures had been introduced to curb overtime costs in the first half of 2018, there was no detailed plan for how the overtime bill could be substantially reduced and sustained. When the report was being finalised, the accounting officer stated in response to that finding that a number of initiatives were currently being piloted that had the potential to achieve better control of overtime use. The accounting officer will be able to update the committee in that regard. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, now, Commissioner Harris, can we have your uh, opening statement, please? Uh, thank you very much, Chair, Committee Members. Um, I take my statutory function of Accounting Officer for Angarda Shikana very seriously. I'm strongly focused on ensuring that the public money invested in us is spent efficiently, effectively and appropriately. As an organisation with a £1.7 billion annual budget, it is vital that I and we collectively demonstrate that we are providing value for money. For, the, for me, that means maximising our policing impact for the benefit of the public within the budget given to us by government. It is also that we spend public money in line with accounting and governance best practice. I am strongly of the view that our budget is our budget, and since I became Commissioner in September of last year, I have continually stressed to managers at all levels of the organisation of the need for us to stay within our budget. This can best be seen in the reduction in discretionary and administrative overtime spent in the last three months of 2018, which achieved substantial savings for the Exchequer. The savings achieved by these measures have carried forward into 2019, as the actual spend for the first quarter of £21.7 million is some £6 million less than the corresponding 2018 quarter. While we are largely on target for overtime spend, this requires constant monitoring and vigilance to ensure there is no slippage, and I met with senior managers last week to stress this point to them again. And even yesterday, I discussed budget matters with the Superintendents Association at great length. While these controls have had impact on the delivery of policing, overtime is still available, particularly in relation to specific policing and security operations around organised crime and violent distant Republicans. The introduction of a mandatory 15-minute parading time is a significant proportion of the Garda overtime budget and is a fixed cost that I have no influence over at this moment. So, for example, in 2019, approximately €22 million Euro out of our overtime budget of €95 million Euro will be spent on the 15-minute parading time. This effectively means that our real operational budget is only €73 million. Euro. There is also overtime associated with Garda members securing and attending courts, securing prisoners and escorting people from the country. These again are regarded as non-discretionary activities. However, on the proportion under our, our control, we must ensure that we stay within budget, and this means making hard choices and hard decisions. In relation to the 2017 accounts for Garda Shikana and significantly and specifically the significant overspend and overtime in that year, there are a number of factors that attribute to this, such as the aforementioned mandatory 15-minute parading time, as well as the major 24-7 policing resources required to protect lives and communities 
as a result of an outbreak of vicious ongoing gangland feuds. I fully accept the findings of the Comptroller and Auditor General and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform that the 2017 overspend on overtime is not sustainable and demonstrated the need for stronger controls and governance and a requirement for modern systems to monitor same. Further to the controls already that we've put in place, we will address these issues through a number of additional members, er, measures. The introduction of a roster and duty management system, which has been piloted in a Dublin division and will start rolling out to the organisation later this year, will improve our ability to plan, control and manage the deployment of personnel and also then the expenditure of overtime. This should result in savings in overtime more through the more effective and efficient resource allocation. However, the full rollout of this programme will not happen until the end of 2020. Our new divisional policing model, currently being designed and piloted in four divisions, includes a greater investment in Garda staff with financial expertise who can provide local management with better information and data on their overtime and other expenditures. Our workforce force plan will advance workforce modernisation and see us deploy our personnel where they are needed most, again leading to operational efficiencies. ICT initiatives such as the investigation management system just started to roll out and our mobility project which this year will enable around 2,000 Gardaí to access Garda systems remotely will reduce the time Gardaí have to spend on paperwork and focus their time on policing activity. The mobility project in particular can allow network connection to systems and decrease the time spent, therefore, in stations. We have also committed in our 2019 policing plan to establishing a framework to provide for multi-annual budgeting and delegated sanctions. Again, this will make it easier for local management to plan resource deployment based on the budgets available to them. To conclude, Chair, we have been provided with a large amount of taxpayers' money all of us in Angarda Shikana have a duty to ensure that it is spent wisely and for, for the benefit of the public. We are a public service and our, our spending should be focused on the public good and keeping people safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Mr Harris and Commissioner Harris, and apologies for not being here for your opening statement, which I've already read and want to thank and people who chaired the meeting in my absence. At this stage, we will revert back to the original sequence of opening speakers, which was uh, Alan Kelly, who has 20 minutes, followed by Peter Burke, uh, 15 minutes, and then the following members have indicated in the following sequence, Deputy Catherine Murphy, Deputy David Cullen Nan, and Deputy Catherine Connolly. Uh, Deputy Kelly. Um, uh, thank you. Chair and timely reappearance there. Um, uh, welcome again to all the uh, uh, witnesses. Um, I want to start off by focusing on the overtime and then I have a couple of questions at the end as regards the appropriation uh, side of things. Um, there seemed to be a serious spike in overtime in 2017 if you do a comparison with 2014. Um, and obviously that was the year that they, there was a, a kind of a pay deal in relation to Angarda Shiakana. Um, and understandable uh, so um, but three times 2014 in three years um, and particularly in relation to that year and I understand Commissioner I 100% understand the fixed costs you have in relation to um, parading you might just explain what that actually is to some of the people you know because a lot of people don't understand why it's necessary for every guard just a small thing um, and there are other fixed costs, um, which we understand. But, you know, we deal an awful lot with accounts from various different organisations. To have a, a trebling in the space of three years is very unusual. And is there something specific to 2017 relating to management of the agreed pay deal? Because we all know the controversy at the time, inverted commas, blue flu, and all of that sort of stuff. Is there something specific there that cause this because there has to be you know there has to be a causal there has to be a causal reason so that's my first question um well uh, i may also here defer to um, deputy john toomey and to uh, of CEO course joe nugent in respect of this um but say in 2017 was the introduction of the mandatory 15 minute um briefing time uh, but we and in some ways that is a fixed cost 
um, and it costs us, it will cost us in and around 22 million euro this year. And indeed, as the, as the number of members that we have grows, that that cost will continue to grow if, if that if that 15 minutes uh, stays in, stays in place. Um, and so that considerably reduces. That was a considerable cost in that year. And additionally, that year as well, um, an allowance around uh, rent allowance was also then uh, built into um, salary and became pensionable but also added then to the hourly rate so actual overtime became more expensive of, of itself because that one time allowance then became pay and that raised the, the hourly rate. So those two factors apply to that and then as I've said in my opening comments um, there was uh, this vicious uh, drugs feud um, and that required an extraordinary response from the organisation and, and perhaps if I looked at to John initially to maybe outline some of just the operational impacts of that in, in that particular year. The, the operational uh, element of it was it, it involved um, the armed, armed support unit uh, in the Dublin metropolitan region um, and um, that, that unit at, at that particular time was based in each of the Garda regions outside of the Dublin metropolitan region. But in response to the issue with the feud, we had to temporarily transfer people up from the country into the city. While we, while we were running the process of recruiting and training and establishing, that has since been established and there is now a permanent armed support unit in the Dublin metropolitan region. But that, that, that created, because it was an emerging issue and we, we, we took the, the decision that we had to have an immediate response to it, it meant redeploying on a temporary basis resources into the Dublin metropolitan region and that led to the, to the operational demand. Uh, in addition to that, um, <clears throat> our national units, we had only begun the process of backfilling our national units um, and there was a, a shortage of staff in, in, in those particular areas and we had to supplement those staff because they were the ones who were actually investigating this, the, 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 these, these serious <coughs> crimes. Uh, we put additional resources also into our Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau in, in, in the case of a, a special crime task force, this equally uh, resulted in, in, in um, temporarily transferring people in, in, into that particular area. They were the key, made, they were the main operational issues that, that contributed to that I, spike. I understand there were specific issues related to that year, and we all remember what was happening in relation to the drug feud, feud at the time. And that would, uh, well, um, there was a 44.2 million supplementary request to the Department of Justice. I'm just quite conscious as regards the Department of Justice at the time. Obviously there was a lot going on here. There were serious issues, uh, and may I say correctly so, um, there's not one of us here who don't have no, you know, friends and people who grew up in the Gardaí, great working, hard working people, but there were serious concerns in relation to pay and conditions and all at that time, and the issues were dealt with. That's not the issue I'm, I'm trying to get at here. The issue I'm trying to get at here is, you know, so we had an issue building from 2014 to 2017. It trebled in 2017. We now have issues, and in fairness, you've made your comments in relation to overtime in the last six months or so, and having to manage your budget. And as a PAC, we obviously respect that. But the process by which we manage what is, in many cases, demand-led, because there are issues going on now in Drogheda. There are issues going on, potentially, Brexit, God, you know, I mean, as regards, um, as a committee, obviously we look retrospectively, but we also look at process, you know. So how do we ensure uh, that, you know, there isn't going to be this elastication with the Department of Justice and having to go back, you know, based on demand requirements? Or can we? Or can we actually do that? I mean, you can't predict what's going to happen next. I can't predict what's going to happen next. How do we ensure that there are processes in place that then show that it is justifiable, you know, I mean, justifiable expenditure, which, you know, over time is necessary, completely necessary, but that the processes are in place to show that. I mean, I suppose the real issue here was when there was a report, and it's in our pack today, of, of, of a guard who got 76,000, you know, in overtime. I mean, obviously that is you know, way up here. Extraordinary, and then there was others. Now they are they are highlighters. We understand that, but for us to understand this, once we know that the processes are in place.
to allow this elasticity, then coming back for supplementaries or appearing here and all of that. That is the key issue here, because to see a trebling in three years, we can explain the things as, 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 as John has said, which I 100% respect, and you could have other issues, like we've got the issues in Drogheda at the moment. How do we ensure that there are processes in place to make sure that we can justify this? Well, um, that falls squarely on my shoulders as the accountant officer, as how do we manage the overtime. Um, and one, we're, we're a grown organisation, um, and we have, um, and, and, we're growing, and there's a growing budget, and we're growing in terms of our sizes, um, our size as well. We, uh, in overall numbers, uh, our high point previously was, was in 2009, and when you add Garda staff to Garda members, uh, we're, we're now in excess of that. So we're as large as we've ever been, and, and, and still more expansion uh, is planned. But it's for me then to, to direct on how, the priorities by which we spend our money. A lot, of, a lot of, of the overtime budget seems to get caught up in practices around which we feel we've, uh, or at the moment we feel we've no discretion on, and that takes money then away from the operational drive that I'd also want from the overtime. So the, the, quarter, the, the quarter hour briefing time, that, that drains money out of the overtime budget and effectively leaves us within the round 72, 73 million, and that's considerably less flexibility than we had in 2017 in, respe in respect of uh, budgets and a lot of documentation compares us with other jurisdictions and with respect other, in other jurisdictions police services there have and uh, no longer take on some of the duties which still fall very squarely on and Garda Shikana um, and do, do, do take up our overtime budget things like um, the escort of prisoners to and from courts largely eradicated in other, in other jurisdictions. Now, and I think whenever we are facing such pressures around serious criminality and having to you know, supplement our policing effort to prevent serious crime, um, in particular at the moment obviously we've got a very difficult issue in respect of ongoing vicious drug feuds, then other, other places that we spend money, it is um, an obligation on, on me and the senior team to look how we're spending that money and could, it, could this be done some other way or, or differently which wouldn't actually cost uh, as much or the same amount of overtime. So that's not only just about things which we think um, uh, we could divest ourselves of responsibility for but also the manner then in which we take on other operations and we adopt a different uh, profile in respect of those as well. Because uh, there is a hierarchy of, of the priority of how we spend our money, and we have to focus obviously on serious criminality, particularly where you know, lives, uh, lives are at danger and serious risk um, of harm. Um, the, the deputy is undertaking a project for me at the moment for um, you know, a deep analysis of just where our overtime is going. Um, in some uh, divisions, I would report. And it since last September, isn't that correct? Well, you know, we, we uh, it's it's been well. It's really uh, at the moment we are under severe pressure with our overtime budget, and we want to take and, and we've we've done well since last September. Well, how long uh, is this? Just to clarify, because it, yeah. it's September to September, I think is what we saw. Is that correct? Well, is that the time period you're using? Um, well, no, we would use uh, the, the annual period, I suppose. Uh, okay. Why I'm referring from last September is when I arrived. Um, and July and August were, were good months in terms of the expenditure and bringing it under control. But we've managed on our rosters from September onwards in and about 6.5, 6.7 million, which gives us an outturn of in the round the, the mid-90 million, which is, is, is what our target is. Uh, but that's, that is very tight, given the pressures that we have upon us. So, there's one, where, where we're spending our money, two, do we have to spend it there, and three, where we do have to go, what should, our, what should our, actually our deployment profile be, and how can we address that? There's other factors in this. I've talked about the um, RDMS system to give us information, because at, at the moment, because it's a very much a paper process, it's very retrospective. And so I don't have a daily or weekly view of what is the overspend, overtime spend for, for last week. Or, or so you have no management information on well, it? The, the management information is slow. It's you, on you backwards. Know, it's looking backwards, and you're depending upon you know, anecdote about where pressure is as opposed to the hard facts that the RDMS system uh, would give us uh, 
further down the line. But that, you know, realistically, that's the end of the 2020 before that's going to make an impact. Just, sorry, you mentioned the system there. Just explain the, to the viewers who are watching this what that means when you use your, just, and sorry for the interrupt, just explain the, what that system is, uh, or the name R of it. RDMS is the Resource Deployment Management System. Okay. Uh, and so, in effect, um, members uh, are detailed on that and uh, in a, come on and off duty on that as well. That records their overtime um, and their allowances and should manage then their pay. We want that, that'll take a, quite a bit of paper out of the system, but also then will give us a daily you know, view of just where the expenditure is at any one time and where it's been spent on as well. Too. So, uh, and, and a good deal more uh, information than we have at this moment in time. I, I presume multi-annual budgets would be a better process fee. Um, that comes jumping out of this, uh, this analysis, by the way. Uh, it's, a, it's something I think we would highly recommend as well. I mean, multi-annual budgets, dro just dropping the hammer on a budget is in relation to yourselves, which so demand-led for me would seem to be... You know, a real issue. There's a couple of other things, though, in relation to it, um, and just having dug through this, uh, is there any way in which, like, none of us as public representatives could ju ju not justify overtime, which is absolutely necessary to protect people, right? Yeah. And it's demand-led. We can't sit here and say, because on the other side of the fence, we're saying, well, lads, why aren't you doing something about all of this, you know? Yeah. So it's, this is about the process by which this is accounted for. So the management information systems you talk about, etc. Um, but furthermore, uh, what's, big, what's usually jumping out here is obviously divestment, civil, civil, you know, the whole civilization of certain yes. components of it that jumps out here uh, hugely as well. Uh, but furthermore, it's IT. There seems to be a huge deficiency in here in IT. And this is a message to go back to the department. Um, we've seen this before. Um, you know, capital investment in IT will have multiple savings down and efficiencies down the road and return greater uh, outcomes. I mean, you know, take for instance your normal Garda sergeant inspector who's affected by this and the fact that at the end of a, a long day they have to then, in many cases, go back to a station, do inputs or paperwork, etc. in 2019. That's crazy. I'm trying to help you here. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that somebody is out there doing a long shift, and we all know guards, uh, very, doing a huge day's work, and involved in community activities, and they're late for the training of the lads because they had to go back and do this, that, and the other. Surely, in a couple of years, we have to have a system whereby there'll be handheld devices where they can just literally drop them into the system. Yeah. They, you know, obviously secure and all of that. I come from an IT yeah. background, but, you know, all of that. Is there a plan to ensure? Because, firstly, they have lives to live. Secondly, we know the demand-led uh, nature of this in, uh, in relation to what we just spoke about. But, you know, the nature of being a guard, you know, to know that there's a certainty as regards, obviously your, your hours change, but there has to be some degree of certainty. And it's not being helped, you know, because of the, the nature by which they have to do their duties post at the end yes. of the day or beginning of a day or the handover process handover between, between, cap, between sergeants, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a plan in place for that? Because that's, I think, jumping glaringly off this. Well, um, in respect to that, I point in particular to the mobility project. So in, um, in this year, um, 2,000 handheld devices, smartphones, will be issued, and that allows then you know, fast time retrieval of information uh, from our systems. Now, that will develop on further in terms of being able to input information to, uh, in effect, resolve calls, result calls on uh, the Pulse systems. And uh, that's where we want to get to in terms of being allowing members to stay out in the ground and also then uh, our, our Garda information service that we have as well. So the members can phone in and then uh, a member of Garda staff can take details for them and do input as because well. Because, to be fair, guards are using their phones, private phones, all well, the time. And that's mad. That well, we, Without them, they'd be lost. Well, by the end, end of 2020, I think we're going to have about 10,000 of these smartphones issued. So uh, those, those guards, and particularly on you know, uniform, high-vis duties, should all have connectivity 
um, across uh, the network, and, that, and that'll be secure connectivity in, into the systems, but also then the ability to ring in on an official phone and, and provide information. And you know, in effect, we need the service centres to be able to take those calls um, as well, but also um, it'll keep guards out in the ground as opposed to having coming back. And as filling out forms and the laborious processes those are. And um, you know, I look to other initiatives that we have with the investigation management system. That rollout has started. started. That'll take um, to the end of 2020 as well. So in these two years, um, the actual garden and ground will see good investment in terms of making their life easier and making their work also more, more efficient. Um, in terms of just their connectivity and their ability to, you know, one-time input instead of filling out several forms, etc. Okay, um, just uh, one last question on uh, on on overtime, and then I'll move on to a couple of questions on appropriation. They're they're a bit jumpy around the questions, but obviously this covers guard sergeants and inspectors. Yes. Pro rata, um, was there any in 2017 in particular? Because it seemed like a year would, I mean, like obviously. I'd rank above that. Um, they pro rata, they would have been, you know, serious workload, scheduled workloads, yeah. you know, because of you know, the year that was in it. I mean, pro rata was was how how was that dealt with as regards pay and remuneration for the extra workload, to, you know, for for those individuals as well. Or is there was there is there a, was there something you know, honest question like. Why, you know, obviously they would deserve remuneration as well. Was there extra costs for above inspector rank is what I'm asking? No. No, no. would be the answer to that question. Okay. So that's a fixed. That's, that's a fixed, fixed cost. cost. So once you hit, once, so see, so the, you've got to remember here, while we're talking, the public are watching. Yeah. So, like, this is, you know, for them. So from above inspector cost, there is no overtime and no extra costs. No. Perfect. Okay. Very simple question. All right. Um, a couple of... Uh, a couple of uh, issues. Uh, I just want to refresh. Multi-annual budgets, um, IT and civilised civilisation. Those three things are critical to the issues we just spoke about, in my view, anyway. Um, in relation to a few other issues, um, capital commitments. Uh, it's in the appropriation accounts. Issues in relation to Galway and Kevin Street. Um, there seems to be a pattern between both of them as regards what happened. Uh, can we explain that? Um, have, what, what have the learnings been there? And um, uh, Commissioner, uh, on, just for you, I mean, are there, you know, are there learnings from this as regards potentially other stations that you may wish to open into the future or something like that? Because the nature of policing is going to, I suppose, go a bit half circular around again as regards the need for community uh, policing. Uh, are there any learnings in relation to this, um, uh, in relation to those two specific projects? Joe, you're probably going to answer that and then Commissioner. So the, fir the, first, the first part, Deputy, the, the management of the building program is, is, to, is led for us by the Office of Public Works. They are the agent who uh, engaged directly in terms of the design and with the contractor in terms of the build. Um, we have the money, which is a strange sort of relationship, but it's a matter that we've raised with, with the Department of Public Do you think that expansion. should be different? I do. I, I, I do, and I've expressed that. I think you might Commissioner, remind people what your view is. So, so, so the, the Commissioner of Future Policing equally talked about the Commissioner being accounting for all of the, no, of the resources. Sorry, and in this case, in, the, in this particular example, you know, we are one hand, you know, one arm's removed from the You're actual dependent on the OPW. Edge. We are, and, and just to be clear, in fairness, the OPW they've done a really good job for us. I don't want to be overly critical of them, but I think we ultimately are the paymaster for the, the works that are done, over which we have limited control. So I think there's a broader system-based weakness in, in that area. In relation to the specific stations, as as you start digging into, if we take Kevin Street as an example, when you start digging into the ground and you start finding all sorts of um, all sorts of, of matter that you hadn't prepared for as a contractor in fairness that there, there are problems emerge around that and, and claims are made uh, associated with that build and, and that primarily relates to 
uh, those issues. And as you said, Deputy, there are some outstanding claims unsettled at this point and the subject of discussions between the Office of Public Works and the contractor around uh, some, a couple of the sites around the country. Okay. Commissioner? Well, I think um, it must be recognised that so between 2014 and 2022, we'll probably we will increase as an organisation in personnel terms by about 35 per cent. So there is, you know, there are stresses um, in our estate. We are working closely with uh, OPW to resolve those, um, and uh, we've specifically then uh, three projects around new bills that we that we wish to advance um, as well, and that'll ease some of the pressures around um, uh, our older buildings. But also then uh, we have engaged with them around. Uh, further accommodation issues, but we're under a lot of accommodation pressure going. Uh, Presumably, going you forward. agree with Mr. Nugent that it would like you're kind of half in charge of this, but you're not in charge of. It. Would you prefer if you were doing the whole thing? Would you? Well, uh, what I do see is we do get a high quality building. In fact, probably some of the best police type buildings I've ever seen in terms of the, you, you know Wexford, Galway, and Kevin Street. That's good. You know they they're, they you know they are. Um, they're exceptional public buildings, and they will serve for a long, long time as well. So, um, the, the, the 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 quality and the utility of those buildings is very good, and it's hard to walk it's hard to walk away from that. Uh, and so, I, I would always say that we would have an engagement with OPW about this because they have a lot of that expertise in the delivery of such you know, big projects. Really, I, I think there's probably another part for us around. Um, the maintenance and smaller works within the estate, as opposed to those, you know, big capital rebuild type projects, um, okay. and that, I think that's that's where I would see the difference. Okay, the final few questions. Um, these are kind of just bitty short uh, questions. Um, risk management, as regards risk register, since yes. you became commissioner, uh, have you changed the risk register? Uh, well, I've increased, the, I've increased the emphasis and the focus of the risk register. Uh, it's um, subject of examination uh, each week, and it's subject then to one area is, is examined at our senior leadership team meetings as well. So okay. um, it gets focus and uh, examination. Um, Have you dialed up certain aspects? Sorry. Have you dialed up certain teams, certain aspects of it? Yes, well, well uh, yes, we have, and a lot of that is in respect just of the delivery of the organi organisational change project, and in effect, you know, the HR, ICT, and uh, you know, financial st the stresses, pressures that are around that, including some of these estate pressures. Okay. Um, internal audit. Um, obviously, we've been around the houses in relation to internal audit. Um, our chair is qualified in this area, as you'll probably find out later. <laughs> but um, internal audit function, um, has that been resourced up? Because it was a recommendation coming from here, obviously very severely. Uh, appropriately qualified people, all of that. Yes, it has. Just want yes. to tick that box here now, because yes. a and, and number of years ago we had to go through this in well, quite detail. It, and may I add that I, I attend the Internal Audit Committee representing the management side, and Not just good. to show the importance that I that I give actually to internal audit as one of the crucial controls uh, for me as the accountant officer. Okay. Um, two two last questions. Uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be me now if I didn't bring up Templemore because given where I represent, uh, as the chair smiles again, um, we um, we know that the recommendations majoritarily have been implemented. There's two partially implemented. There's four. There's 19 recommendations in relation to this. One is, to rec is the recommendation to implement all recommendations, part that. Yeah. It was kind of an unusual one. Fourteen recommendations, they've been implemented in full. You're satisfied with that? Well, yes, and, and yeah. we've, been, we've been reporting on this to the police that's, authority as, that's right. as recommended. I as understand. Well. Two partially. Um, and it just this relates back to, there's been two of them that are partially concluded. This relates to, let's call it spade a spade, these relate to issues relating to Land and community yeah. issues, sports facilities. Yes. Um, obviously, Temp Templemore and the Garda College are totally synonymous. Yes. It's um, you know it's the centre of activity there. It's it's critical, um, and I'm a huge supporter of it. Um, and I know it's taken time to deal with these issues. Um, I appreciate that they have to be dealt with, though. Yes. I mean, 
I drive into Templemore every week, and the car parking situation alone is insane. It's bananas. It's called a spit. It's absolutely crazy. And I feel sorry for the, you know, the, those. And obviously, you made the decision to go with 600 this year yes. instead of 800. Was yes. that an issue in relation to capacity? Or was it a national issue? Or was it a training issue? Or, I think I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, but I think you kind of said we're full to the boards. Where we, you know, as regards our, our organisation, we can't take much more at this time until we improve our systems. Well, I think. Um, what, what is well, in 2018 we, we brought in uh, 800. Um, in 2019, I wanted to concentrate more on the um, civilianisation. So, in effect, displacing 500. Um, experienced guardy back into the front line, whatever that might be, be it uniform or detective duty. But really, 1,100 get in between. Well, yeah, so um, minus the cessations that there'll be in of the course. year, obviously, in around, in around 300. So rather than concentrating in, in effect in just uh, probationary guardy coming out of, of Templemore, because that, uh, that does have an operational impact because they need mentored, they need a lot of uh, supervision and support. Uh, in, their, in their first six months and then for the next two years and then in subsequent years as well. You know, it takes time. So there is, the, you know, we were reaching a point, I felt, of saturation. And so uh, easing back to 600 this year, which is still a considerable number, but concentrating on the displacement of experienced Gardaí from tasks that Garda staff can take on. That was the priority for this year, and in effect, also was required it was to meet the government targets around to make up the organisation as well. Okay, so I mean, in effect, Templemore has been used for 600, but it's also you've been used for other aspects and retraining and all of that. I, yes, it is. Yes. And that's it's a, it's it's. Well, it does it does take pressure off Templemore and allows other training then to happen, which was being displaced okay. as well. And the last components on this, um, in relation to, and I say this as as a local public representative, you know. The issues there, there's goodwill there from the community. There are issues there that need to be resolved. Obviously, there are issues with the OPW. I know I've spoken, yes. to, I've spoken to the minister, and he is very much uh, looking at solutions. That yes. Hopefully, I understand very close to some form of uh, solutions. So, so, so uh, I have the um, yeah, just, just, yeah, I understand yeah. that. Um, but they have to be solutions that will work for the community as well. Okay. Okay. And that's the one point I'll just refresh and emphasise to you because. Um, obviously, there is, um, there are, I suppose, social contracts that have been made with the people down there yeah. in relation to facilities. <laughs> yes. And when you have facilities like there are the, at the Garda College, you know, there, there needs to be goodwill with the community because there has to be a bit of give and take with where yeah. it's a state where um, where the training college is. So I would encourage you to, if it takes a little bit more time, I'd rather get it right. Okay. Okay. Um, but, Joe, have you an update? Yeah, it, uh, thanks, Deputy. Um, and, and I fully agree with, with what you said there. And indeed, the approach we've taken today has, has focused and prioritised on, on, that, on that way. So the first piece of work that we did was around ensuring that the members of the community had access to the playing fields and to the swimming pool area I remember. in the college. Um, and since then, we have been working on the transfer of the title of the playing fields lands, and that's the football and hurling pitches etc and and I expect well, the contracts have been signed so it's just literally we're days away from title being vested back in the Office of Public Works. The remaining issue is as you said Deputy is that broader amenity uh, in the community we have deliberately not gone into that to resolve the other issues to be respectful exactly as, of, as you said and, and I hear what you're saying around around the engagement in the community we wanted to deal with the other issues first and at that point in time we will have a respectful yeah. piece, making sure that the interests of the state protect it, while at the same time making sure that that social contract with the Perfect. with Temple Moors. I, I'm just, I am, I am, I am. It's just obviously the issue here, the elephant in the room, is also the golf course, which is part of the community yeah. there. And yeah. being honest with you, it would be very hard not to keep there. The very last bit question: When I was minister a number of years ago, I did a pilot program in relation to it. Was actually came from the environment. I came from local government environment. I did a pilot program in relation to providing funding for CCTV programs uh, across a number of spots across CCTV infrastructure. Yeah. It took an elongated period of time. Yes. I'm a huge supporter of this, particularly given high-powered vehicles going up and down motorways. You know, there was a 
big issue in relation to Littleton in Tipperary, which is highlighted across the media, the volume yeah. because of where it was in Ireland. We also put them in Board Hill and Borges. I there is, has always been issues in relation to data management there. Yes. For the public outside, they don't understand how this takes so long. I would just encourage you to work with the local authorities. A little bit of give and take as regards data management here, because the, the, the throughput and the output of what this would give to yourselves and the peace of mind it would give to the communities is worth vast more than the time it is taken to sort it out. And I'm not proportionating blame, but there are probably issues here on both sides. We just need to ensure there's a process in place, we stick to it, and it's used across the country. Okay, well, no, and that's fine, we would agree with that. Um, and in particular, I, I think in some of these very difficult areas, we would like to see, yeah, in fact, more CCTV, Absolutely. and yeah. also um, we, look f we look forward also to making submissions around legislation to enable uh, further use of static um, automatic number plate recognition in particular um, and, uh, and, and using that for the purposes of, of the prevention and detection of crime. So there's a, and there's a lot of technolo other technology then that can be brought to bear. So, you know, our average speed cameras, so people recording people's speed, not just at a point, but over a distance and particularly, maybe not so much the motorways, but other major roads which, which have, are blighted by serious road traffic collisions, you know, uh, average speed cameras would be a, an effective like road safety tunnel. response. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I you. want to call Deputy Burke. Thank you, Deputy Kelly. Deputy thank, Burke. thank you, Cahirlock, and uh, I welcome the Garda Commissioner and his team. And uh, I think there's a huge amount to be proud of in on Garda Shirkana. Um, it's interesting at the moment uh, when a lot of us are on the doorsteps, I see firsthand a huge uh, work that uh, community, community policing is doing, especially in my own town in Mullingar, and uh, in terms of gaining the trust of the community, working with them, and when we'd all say we need more bodies on the ground, it's uh, amazing to see the great work that's been, been done. And it just shows you in terms of the spirit of Angarda Shikon, I would say, um, last week uh, I encountered a very sick child uh, on my uh, travels, and um, one of the community Gardaí, Garda Blake, was calling into him on his way home from his shift because he has a huge infatuation with the Gardaí. And it just really brings home to you the huge work, the huge spirit of community in terms of fostering communities. And I think, uh, you know, community Gardaí couldn't be supported enough in terms of the good work that they do. So uh, I wish you well in your, in your role and uh, continued uh, success for all the team. Uh, just, um, just first, I just want to raise um, this issue in terms of uh, the numbers of drivers who have been uh, disqualified uh, either in foot of uh, a court order or through the court sor court's uh, service versus uh, the number of uh, licences uh, that have been uh, surrendered. And I just want to know in terms of you as Commissioner, do you have uh, confidence in terms of how this uh, process is working and is it working as prescribed? Um, well, my understanding is it's not working um, as we would wish, and it's not working as uh, one would wish in that disqualified drivers, um, by and large, the majority are retaining uh, their licence. Um, and, and that's not good. Um, and in fact, actually, it is a, it's a road safety issue, and people are, in effect, uh, evading the justice which was uh, handed out to them. Um, and I would, but I would point to, we need systems to deal with this. One of those is the, motor, is the mobility project that I talked about. Because if you reduce your license to the guard uh, who has um, this device and they take a picture of it, it will immediately tell them that uh, you either properly should be on the road or you are a disqualified driver. So there is, there is a piece about the, about the application of modern technology um, to this and the transmission of information to us to allow us to get it under our pulse system to make sure our pulse system is up to date so that yeah. uh, members on the ground can have access to the accurate information that they're then they're able to follow yeah. through um, uh, an enforcement. When one sees the pace that new legislation has been put into statute in terms of additional controls around uh, drink driving, in terms of yeah. proposals, in terms of. Uh, having your licence at all times and additional restrictions on speeding, etc. You know, it's very alarming to note, and I would point out, it's very difficult to have confidence in the way the system is currently operating. And uh, in one parliamentary question, uh, which I've tabled there, over an eight-year period, uh, from 2011, only 6% of drivers who were disqualified 
had their licence surrendered, 6%. In 2012, it was 7%. 2013, 9%. And over, um, over an eight-year period, out of 83,000 drivers, only 11% had surrendered their life licence. So that means all those drivers who have been disqualified are driving around in our roads. And when one considers that 7% of fatal accidents have been caused by disqualified drivers, there is a number of fatalities that are being driven by this. So if you have someone who commits a crime or who is disqualified from driving to go to court, like how, in terms of logistically, or how does the service operate that it allows them to retain their licence? You're right when you say that it has been the subject of some considerable discussion before, um, and there was a number of prosecutions taken in this regard, and it, le it did lead to some uh, difficulties and challenges. Uh, and, uh, work has been done over the last couple of years to streamline and improve the process, uh, and I think that we would be hopeful and confident that we, we will see improvements uh, into the future in terms of this area. The most important thing, uh, from our perspective, is that members of Angara Shikana on the side of the road who encounter these people have that information uh, at that particular time to enable them to take the appropriate action. And I think the Commissioner ha has outlined how that issue will be addressed. In, 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 parallel, in 2015, I think a guard Shikana were given additional powers in this regard in terms of they could directly go to the courts, they don't have to serve a summons on individuals uh, who are caught on the roadside who have been disqualified and are still driving. But would you not agree this is a crisis point, that if you have a situation where only 11% of people uh, who have been disqualified are still out there driving and carrying their licence? Like, it is a crisis point well, uh, well, 11%, for the administration of justice. 11% is, is not an acceptable figure, uh, and it, 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 it needs to be addressed and addressed uh, as, a, as a matter of urgency. But, uh, the two processes in how that is being dealt, dealt with, and the first one is ensuring that the members of Angara Shikana at the side of the road have the appropriate information at that particular, <coughs> at that particular time. And in all of these issues, there, there are processes uh, that take time to be implemented, and I think we've outlined earlier on how that particular area is being addressed, and, and the issue of the 2,000 mobile phones this year. Uh, will address that, mm -hmm. that, that particular area. Just, if I could ask you some process for two areas. If you have someone who, on aggregate, goes past 12 penalty points, how, in terms of, is their licence in theory surrendered? Is it up to the individual? Do they have to go to court? Or what happens if they exceed the 12 points? Um, they get a letter from the Road Safety Authority, which instructs them to send it uh, to the Driving Licensing uh, Authority who retain it until after that period of disqualification and the licence is then returned to them. So it's almost like self-assessment. It's up to the individual to go with yes. the licence. Yes. And just secondly, in terms of if you were a prosecuting Garda, you're in court uh, with an individual who is disqualified in court. They're standing there before the judge. They're disqualified. What, how do they have to hand in their licence? What happens in that set of events? There is a requirement in legislation under Section 20 that they have to produce that licence uh, in, in court. Um, and that, that is and if, if they say, I don't have my licence with me today? Well, very often the case is put back and remanded for them to, to, to produce it at a later date. Um, and I think on, on a previous occasion we, we reported to, uh, to the committee that we took a number of prosecutions for that particular issue and that identified some of the areas that were addressed uh, uh, in terms of process, in terms of address of a, uh, an offence code provided uh, by the Director of Public Prosecutions to Angarda Shirkana. And all of those issues are, 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 uh, have been addressed. It's a very complicated process. And even in, in discussing it here this morning, the process of uh, a licence being surrendered to the licensing authority and then Angarda Shirkana notified, and similarly with the, with the court. Uh, and, and, and bringing it to court. How does someone evade hands it in through the courts then if it's, in theory, if it's so strict in terms of what you're outlining? I beg your pardon? How does someone avoid surrendering their licence through the court service if it's so strict as you're outlining? Well, it, it's strict in that, 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 that it's to be brought to the court, but I think what has happened in experience is that may, that may not always happen uh, and that is not always then you know, follow yeah. through because the, the, the other offences and there may, may be fines uh, included in the court and they are pursued and followed up. So 
Um, the, the difficulty being the process that it is after that is where the complications ha have, a, have arisen, and particularly in relation to identification in terms of it is, the, is, is it the individual that's before the court, if there are multiple names, and, and all of those create complications in terms of bringing a, a swift prosecution in, in these areas. Because one could argue you, you have all the legislation you need to do it. Is that correct? It's not, it's not a gap in legislation. It's just in terms of carrying out this yeah, it, act in terms it, it, of getting it, it, someone's licence. It is more of a process issue than a legislation yeah. issue. But, but uh, it is, I mean, to me it is crisis point when you look at from 2011 right up to 2018. The figures have hovered anywhere between 6%. The highest uh, was 19%. You know, and it's, it has reduced again. 2018, it looks like it's gone back down to 13% in terms of those who have handed in their licence. And even if you allow for the appeal process whereby uh, someone who wins an appeal and has taken off the disqualified list later, you know, it's still, still very, very high, the figures are. They're drastic in terms of what it's saying, in terms of the administration of justice, in terms of our road traffic acts and how uh, they are uh, acted on in terms of buying Garda Shikana. Like, you, you must be hugely worried about this. Well, it, it, is a, it is an area of concern. Our Assistant Commissioner for uh, Roads Policing um, is, is putting together specific action points around this. So uh, if, if we could be permitted then to uh, write to the committee to ex explain that, that further, because um, I think there's a piece about just public information, and then there's also a piece then around uh, further enforcement. And the mobility devices, the, the smartphones that we've talked about and their scanning ability, that there's a concentration of those in this year on the ro on roads policing, uh, and so you know the roads policing uh, members are most likely to encounter uh, individuals who are, are breaking the law in terms of of road traffic legislation uh, will be the ones with the appropriate equipment, and that they you know we're aiming at 2,000 by end of year, so that means every week you know literally dozens of these are going out, and it will make a difference in terms of enforcement on the ground. But uh, I know Dave has, uh, has uh, AC Dave Sheehan has um, all our thoughts about what we should do about this, and particularly on how we might present this, these matters in court as well. So, if we can be permitted to come back with more detail, then, because uh, you know we do regard this as an area of concern, and people in effect uh, are, are flaunting and abusing the criminal process here. Are you agreeable that the committee gets a formal note back? Yeah, I, I would welcome that. And just t two other brief questions then. Um, on another area, just in relation to the revenue commissioners and the uh, voluntary disclosure uh, to uh, the revenue commissioners, have we any idea how much that was in terms of the value-added tax disclosure? So the, the process is not concluded, Deputy, so if we can again, I, I would hope that it would be resolved within the next month or so, and if we, again, if we could uh, come back and report formally to the committee on that. It will feature, obviously, in the audit that, that the CNAG will be doing on our, on our account for 2019, but if we can write back with more detail when, when it is finalised, and I understand it's very close to finalisation. Right, and the error, there were four tax numbers, I think, at that stage in operation, and one was at, or five, and one was at issue, is that correct? So, so there's only, so that we now have, I believe, just the two, um, two, is that right, Ryan, just looking at you? So. Yeah, main, main go the tax number. Sportsfield Company in that entity, while it hangs out there, has its own tax number, that, and, and that's they're, they're really where, they, where we're there. The main issue of, um, of tax compliance, though, related to the operation of the restaurant and associated facilities within the college itself, so not, mm -hmm. not by Sportsfield. So the main gauder, um, the main gauder tax number will be um, responsible for those issues. But as I said, we're very, we are very close. I'm hoping to finalisation of the issue, and I'm more than happy to provide a detailed report to the committee, which will be within weeks. Uh, I, I would hope to update you on what's happening in that. And obviously, you'll be able to produce a tax clearance certificate. Oh, for we those have tax clearance that. certificate. Like the, the, the issues of tax clearance, I think the revenue have been very happy with their engagement with them. So that issue, I don't think, is, 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 is a factor for us. And it's a final question, just in terms of um, the level of uh, non compliant with procurement and competitive tenders, it just seems to be increasing. Now, I know some of the services that you would procure, uh, there aren't many suppliers for them. Uh, I, I accept that, but um, I think 2017, to point out there's 128 contracts, there seems to be a significant increase in the number, um, the value of 28 million 78. So the, the majority of that, almost half that, close to half that spend related to IT contracts which are, um, 
which are either either con new contracts have been now in place or they are we're waiting for OGP just to sign off on the contracts. That will take out half of the spend. The major areas of, of difficulty that we, we continue to have are in the provision of towing services where there have been legal challenges in the past and, and that's delayed us putting in place procurement where we still have a requirement to deliver services uh, and medical services where in parts of the country uh, there are GPs who just do not want to to enter into any contractual arrangement with us. So we're going to continue unfortunately Deputy with, with reasonably large numbers of contracts. Our job is to try and reduce the, the monetary value of those contracts to the, to the greatest extent possible. As I said, I, I believe the IT ones will be resolved this year, so I don't see that as being an issue in 2019, uh, and that will take out probably something in the order of 11, 12 million out of the 27 million that you've referenced. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Deputy Murphy. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, the, uh, just in relation to the, uh, the overtime and the parading or the uh, briefing before uh, before the day starts, um, should that be more properly a fixed charge, in your opinion? Um, in terms of the, well, uh, we, we work, I, I have a query about that 15 minute briefing time in the first place. I have to say we work a five unit, five shift system which allows for overlaps and, and part of that is actually so that um, your briefing and debriefing can take place during your normal tour of duty and there's no requirement at all for overtime. Now, uh, under the Commission and then uh, subsequently you know, the delivery of the, the uh, Commission of Future Policing, uh, we, we are required to look both at rosters but also at some of the allowance and pay issues and I think uh, once that area of work is opened up then we can look at um, what we have in terms of these uh, residual um, issues. The, the Rasta itself, I think, uh, is a Rasta um, which is pretty inflexible and costs and costs money. And I think, uh, you know, I require um, a Rasta which is operationally effective, which does give us uh, greater numbers at times of greatest demand, but also has has some flexibility within reasonable within reasonable parameters for a management to direct members. So at, at some point in the future when that piece of work is done, you will be able to address that issue? Well, uh, yes, that, that, would be the, that, that would be the intention because certainly that, 20, you know, that 22 million drain on our overtime budget, n neither is that sustainable and we want to move quickly on that. We also want to move quickly on uh, having a further look at the rosters that apply okay. uh, within the organisation and addressing those. And, and I think I'll address some of our overtime issues because okay. I, I can ask, I feel, for a roster which is um, operationally, which operationally delivers against the demands that we have from the public for our services. Okay. Um, just um, in relation to the uh, overtime and um, where it originates, there is, I mean, you inherit it like anyone coming into a job does, you inherit it a situation that you might not have designed yourself. Um, uh, the, um, I, I, I compiled over some time, I compiled, it's actually a few years old, uh, you know, because I wanted to get an overview of, of, of the spread of, of the force because I felt that my area wasn't doing particularly well and of course that uh, the, the conclusion of, of, of lots of parliamentary questions showed just that that um, areas that had grown in population um, are, are at the low end of the ratio of police uh, regard to population. Uh, Mead being the worst one since the most previous, uh, since the, the previous um, census of population, Kildare is next. And, and you, you, the ones that you will tend to see will be Wexford, uh, Leash off Lee, um, uh, you know, areas that, areas that are, are growing uh, and, and growing kind of a, sub, with substantial population growth over a period of time where the resources don't keep pace. Is there any evidence that the, that the, 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 the um, overtime budget in those areas is higher than it is uh, in areas that would have a, maybe a, a better ratio of guards to population? Um, 
Well, the, uh, the, the, that, question, that question opens up a, a number of assets, or a number of facets. One of which is um, our, our ability to recognise demand and how demand is changing. And I point to the new uh, computer-aided dis dispatch uh, program or uh, process that we're putting in place, which will give us a far greater handle on where our calls are coming from what the, and what the demand is. Um, sometimes population growth doesn't actually mean that demand will, uh, you know, increase in proportion with with that population. Populations can be quite subtle and law and law abiding. It doesn't need necessarily flow that that we need to provide resources. But the point you raise about overtime, um, uh, a lot of the overtime is concentrated in critical areas. Inevitably, that has meant uh, some, co you know, greater concentration here in the, in the city, but also then we've had to readdress because of the uh, facets of the uh, feud in, in Meath and uh, Alive as well. Yeah, um, like, let me just give you some, well, first of all, it was referred to, we get a good idea when we're out knocking on doors what's on people's minds, yes. and at the moment we're getting a pretty decent overview. Um, and I would say that I've never experienced the number of doors that uh, raise the issue of concern in relation to burglaries and things like that in my particular area at the moment. And I, I wouldn't be um, uh, co complaining about the guards, it's just the number of them yes. that's, the, that's yes. the issue, because I think they handle it very well when, when it's, uh, or, or as well as can be, it can be handled. So it, it, the, the, the ratio, the ratio, for example, if the ratio um, was the same around the country as it is in the like of Meath and Kildare, um, you could have four and a half thousand less guards. Now, of course, I say that tongue in cheek, but that is the that is the the, the magnitude of uh, of the disparity. It's a very uh, low ratio of population to guards, and the last commissioner uh, gave an assurance, gave, acknowledged that that was the case, and said that that was going to be rectified by uh, obviously the reopening of Templemore for uh, for recruitment, and that there would be a disproportionate number, a higher proportion uh, allocation to, uh, to areas where there would be uh, where that where that w was the profile. Um, obviously, you can't. You have to balance. Yes. experience as well and I appreciate that um, but um, you've now uh, you've capped obviously or you've, 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 you've limited the number going into Templemore in, in, in the year so that means that those areas could fall back further and if there was a dependence on overtime to fill uh, a need uh, then it's a more expensive solution and it's a reactive solution would you would you equate that or is that is that how you see Temple, the distribution of guards from Templemore anyway um, in, in, our, in, our, in our distribution uh, we're having to focus on where the emerging pressures are and I think you know we've, we've up to now we've had a uh, pretty even distribution. We've built up uh, the northern region, so the, the, uh, the, the border region, probably more than, than other areas, but uh, we have a concentration now going forward on the northern region plus uh, the Dublin metropolitan region as well, um, because both those regions have fallen behind. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are an expanding organisation, uh, everywhere should be seeing more guards. We're also then going through this process of uh, civilianisation or workforce modernisation, and that will displace a further 500. So, you know, the, 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 the actual increase in the operational footprint for this year is, is in the order of, of 800 members, and that, that is very significant, and everywhere should see um, the impact of that. So, the, we are more than happy to pro provide Garda staff to Meath and to other areas to displace Garda members from uh, station type roles uh, and where they can out into some form of operational duties. And so visibility has been made clear to me on a number of occasions and people want to see their guards and want to be and they want to be clear that they're visible. And as we build up our new divisional policing model, an important and central aspect of that will be community policing. An important part of that is that local connection. And, and the visibility piece. Okay, uh, I hope Kildare is included in that. Um, the, 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 the growth of the force um, 
uh, is expected to, by 2021 to, or the aim is to get to 15,000. I know there's, there's retirements uh, as well as intake, um, and it's, it's, not, oh, it's easy to see the intake. It's not that easy to, you know, to evaluate from outside what the, what the retirements would be. Are, do you think that's an achievable aim? Do you think the overtime bill is likely to go down if the, uh, if the, the numbers come up? Um, I think it is achievable, uh, and um, the logic would suggest that over time should come down, uh, but um, practice has shown to me that also members create over time because they detect offences, they go to court, um, and we have this brief in time, as we have talked about, already built in. So inevitably, actually having operational members does create uh, other other overtime and just it's just the frictional overtime you need uh, to op operate as a business um, and so what I need to look to is then where else can I can I cut overtime where, where else can we redeploy or rechange the, our our operational profile and, and so that's that is a task for me around how I prioritize um, my my expenditure there um, I've just I was just provided their figures on uh, Kildare yeah. um, so between 2010 and this year, 2019, they've shown uh, an increase of 63 additional members yeah, there. Yeah, I'm aware that was so, coming from so, a fairly low base. Um, just for, for I, I yes. have the figures. I have the figures going for nearly every year. So I, I but, uh, and, and it's much appreciation that we end up with additional guards. Um, and I don't want to be overly parochial. But it, I think if you look at it relative to other areas with, with a similar population, um, I, I think you will see that it is very significantly behind what it should be. Meat is even further back and, and, and going backwards as the population is growing. But as I say, it's noticed and appreciated when additional guards, because, there's, uh, because we, we appreciate how, how stretched they are. Can I just um, move on to um, just some, something from the approach, appropriation account, because our time is quite Quite limited here, um, and in relation to the voluntary disclosure to the revenue commissioners, can you take us through? Uh, can you take us through um, uh, how that occurred and what the extent of that was? I asked you in so, so deputy, the, the main areas that that are associated with this relate to some salary issues, and a very small amount of that related to salary issues. And uh, the primary, the, the largest portion of the of the issue related to VAT on um, products and services that were provided in the college for non-students. So, um, in essence, uh, VAT wasn't being charged on product and services in the college, and there was an acceptance that for students that a VAT exemption seemed appropriate, but there had been a process whereby um, there were some issues around non well there weren't the, the, it, VAT what, wasn't being collected. And what was the extent of the uh, of the settlement? Well if I can as as I said I, I don't really want to get into a negotiation with the revenue commissioners in it's not public. Concluded. It's not concluded. Okay, but I that's... but we will or we do expect to have that concluded relatively shortly. Okay and then it'll appear presumably in, in Yeah and I'm happy when we have reached a conclusion that we were right okay. I will write to the committee and confirm. And in terms of the storage of property taken into possession and I, I, yeah. I see uh, there's a new electronic ta ta uh, yes. uh, uh, tracking system which I think obviously is very good. Is there, is there any liabilities as a consequence of, uh, of, of what has happened uh, in, in terms prior to that new tracking system? No, not, not, no, I'm not aware of any liability when I'm looking at the deputy as well. I'm not aware of any liability at all, no. Okay, and was there... I think this was about improved processes. Okay. I think this was about rectifying um, processes. I, I think Deputy Kelly at one stage presented a, a photograph from maybe 10 years ago where the, the formality about recording, um, recording property and exhibits wasn't where it should be. So the process were A, to pull this and centralise this together at division level, and secondly then to introduce a, 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 a far a more sophisticated tracking system around the individual elements. Okay. Um, and just finally, um, Commissioner, can I ask you in relation to me? Obviously, you have a unique experience of, of, of having, you know, uh, been a police officer in the PSNI and uh, and the uh, obviously now Commissioner of of, of, of the Gardaí Um Is there anything that kind of surprised you 
um, in terms of, of uh, our, 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 you know, in terms of in, that would jump out immediately in terms of things that you can bring from the point of view of your experience of both. Um, well, um, I, I think the one thing is, is essential is just the digitisation. Um, so that we move to far more efficient processes and with far greater access then to the technology which makes life simpler for uh, all our staff in effect. Uh, we're far too paper based and, and therefore then the management information that I require is difficult actually to extract and for the other senior uh, leaders as well. Uh, the second point is then I think our lines of communication um, are too long um, and uh, we want to you know, flatten probably the superstructure of the organisation so that you know, the superintendent, chief superintendent uh, and uh, higher uh, management ranks so we have a flatter organisation which communicates internally uh, more effectively. I think the, I think the po very positive things to say is, and, and it's already been mentioned, very strong uh, local basis, very strong community support and uh, our ongoing uh, ethos and commitment to um, uh, community policing. And also to say, when I go, when I go around the organisation, um, I'm always very pleased to meet you know, very good people, completely committed to their work, want to do their best, and it's really it's my obligation and duty to give them the best tools that I can. And that's, you know, that's my responsibility, to make sure that they are able to, in effect, provide a policing service um, which is well equipped and and eases out a lot of the burdens that are that are placed on them at the moment. Okay, so are we very considerably further back in relation to the investment in in digital in, in you know Well in the, the investment in IT and the and you know serious investment in IT is underway. I've outlined a number of the projects. Those are important projects and you know, in this year and next towards the tail end of next year we'll, um, our our members will really see um, a big difference. The, the next bit of that will be joining that up so it's seamless in terms of the organisation. When we deal with something, it starts to automatically populate Pulse. It can start to automatically pop populate um, the investigation management system with information and so that would you know, cut out the double key in. But there are other systems that we ha we'd have to look to as well. That would be around custody management and, and other critical areas. It's also around uh, our fingerprint systems as well. So. There's a, lot we, there's a lot that we're doing. We're probably at capacity in what we're doing in terms of ICT at the moment, but there's still you know, many years of, of, of work ahead of us, a good solid five years of, of investment here at least. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Deputy Cullinan. Gordon Mulgars, uh, welcome first of all, Mr. Harrison. Can I wish you well in your uh, role? Um, unfortunately, we've had a high turnover, turnover of Garda commissioners and ministers for justice and a lot of that was obviously down to cultural and organisational issues, as I'm sure you're aware that we had in Garda Shia Khan. So we're, we're hoping that the changes that were promised are being delivered and that some of my questions will be in that uh, vein. But I just want to start with, to pick up on uh, the last point you raised yourself in relation to YCT and the investment over the last five years. And as you said, you want a far more efficient process and at times there may be an over-reliance on paperwork. Broadband is a big topical issue, as I'm sure you're aware. Yes. And I know as late as 2017, 111 out of, out of the 563 operational Garda stations did not have access to broadband. So can I ask, first of all, has that improved? And have you an up-to-date figure of how many at this point in time do not have access to broadband? I, I believe the figure is something in the order of 50 um, at this point. Um, and we're talking here, though, primarily about stations that have very, very small opening hours, you know, who, who are, you know, so the question of leaving very, exp A, getting the broadband into the station, secondly, leaving very expensive and, um, not expensive, leaving very equipment which is a secure nature resident in the station uh, has been the challenge. We've worked with our colleagues in the Office of the Government Chief Information Officer to bring out a different solution and we've put something new in place which will allow us to move faster in terms of, of addressing those, um, those issues. Again, as the Commissioner talked about the mobility project, for the goal it would be about having a phone and essentially 
the phone having the power of a, of a you know, very fast PC being able to dock that in, in a station, use a keyboard and mouse and screen as if they were working on a PC. It's proved very successful in the pilot that we have up and running. We expect to have another 20 or so of those dealt with very shortly. Okay, thanks for that. So, um, so in effect, we're using the network, the 4G network, to provide connectivity to those stations. And um, if you think that mostly we're exchanging uh, data, but, you know, we're not downloading box sets, you know, we're, we're exchanging data. And so we... So well, you hope the speeds, not. Well, we hope not. But the uh, so the speeds are the speeds that the network, the 4G network, and we've had to upgrade some of that can deal with with our our information requirements. Okay, um, I welcome in your opening statement as well that uh, you put a heavy emphasis on your responsibility as the accounting officer. Yes. And that's in relation to financial governance. So I think that would be warmly welcomed by this committee because it's our core function. But I would imagine that you would also put the same emphasis on your responsibility in relation to transparency, good governance and accountability. And in that vein, yesterday, or was it the day before, GSOC raised concerns in relation to their authority. Yes. And first of all, I'm, I'm assuming, of course, you understand why GSOC was established in the first instance yes. and what its role is. It's independent. But they said that they were unable to ensure there was proper oversight of an Garda Sheikha and in fact they said it was impossible for a number of reasons. One, because they find out about issues from the media uh, and not directly from the appropriate channels. And two, that the supposed lines of communication and reporting within an Garda Sheikha in itself was problematic. So given that you take your responsibility seriously, yes. I assume that you would be concerned that that would be GSOC, GSOC's impression and GSOC's view of yes. their ability to be able to do their job independently. Can you first of all just respond to that? Uh, well, um, uh, I, I'll be meeting with GSOC uh, in the next couple of weeks to discuss this, discuss this further. Um, but for my, for my part, uh, if there's wrongdoing within the organisation, um, there's very obviously a, um, a very strong tactical operational reason to um, share that with GSOC because they may too have information about an individual member which is of importance uh, and collectively then we need to pull our resources to make sure that we are rooting out wrongdoing, inappropriate behaviour, criminality um, and there is a way of, there is a, a way of working through this. Um, I don't think in any, any shape or form we're at opposite ends of the argument about this. We just need to find... But you uh, obviously are on the opposite end of the argument if GSOC is saying that well, they find it... One second. If GSOC is saying is that they find it impossible to do their job, which is to hold Angara Shiaikana accountable, um, then there is a difficulty from their perspective. So you might have a different perspective, but they are the independent body. And I think... You know, it, it took a lot, I think, for them to come out in the very clear, stark terms that they did to say, and I quote again, quoting directly from them, the proper oversight of Angarda Shikana is impossible because of Angarda Shikana itself. So I'm assuming that would be concerning to you and that you will, if you don't agree with them, well, then you will want to establish, well, why did they have that view of Angarda Shikana? Well, um, uh, uh, so... Um no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Um, I'm not taking issue with what is said. It, it, it is the manner in which it is then delivered. Um, it, as as the commissioner, I too have a heavy responsibility for the conduct and behaviour of the organisation, up to and including criminality that members may engage in. And I have a duty and responsibility to root that out as well. And I want to work with um, the oversight body, the investigative body, which is which is uh, GSOC. Um, in doing that. So, you know, there's no argument on my part. Um, I know that we have uh, informed them of uh, major investigations that we are engaged in, and obviously then uh, they have written to us about streamlining other processes, and we can do that. And, and that <coughs> is just would be in the form of a regular case conference about you know, serious matters that are progressing. So all of these things um, are achievable within the present, even within the present legislative framework, because it, it's just a matter no, of and I, I accept your response, Commissioner, but you may see them as achievable, but GSOC obviously have a concern that they are not being achieved or not being delivered. And if I can just move on to a related issue yes. um, in relation to this issue of accountability, because yesterday you announced uh, or gave 
uh, or made reference to the setting up of an anti-corruption unit, yes. which on the face of it again looks like the guards investigating the guards. Um, did you have any engagement with GSOC in relation to the establishment of that unit? Have you formally met with GSOC and sought their views? And if so, what were their views in relation to uh, the powers and responsibilities that unit would have? Because we've seen from the Morris Tribunal and we've seen from many other aspects of cultural difficulties within the Garda Síochána that independent oversight is the most valuable tool that we should have and that this anti-corruption unit, is it the guards investigating the guards, first of all, in terms uh, of that unit? Well, it, it, what it is, is is us seeking information. Is it the guards investigating the guards? Uh, it would depend on the matter under investigation. I, uh, I would say that um, to say is it the guards investigating the guards is actually missing the point of the unit. This is about um, dealing and seeking out corruption within the organisation. So it is things like... But that's not uh, missing the point. Sorry, Mr. Harris. It isn't missing the point when to seek out corruption, um, it's international best practice that that corruption is not sought out from people within the force. It's sought out from an independent body. So if GSOC is the independent body, why did you not use their remit and why set up a, a, an internal structure where guards investigate the guards? Well, I, I, would, I would suggest international best practice is a partnership approach uh, to this, that we have a responsibility, I have a responsibility in this, and I'm talking about things uh, in effect proactively asking the organisation what's going on, have they, have they uh, issues with individuals uh, within that they're, they, they're working with, things like um, uh, drug testing, uh, with cause, where we've a, a, sus a suspicion around individuals, but also then drug testing in respect of of high risk positions where uh, members may be carrying or uh, firearms or in charge of of high speed pursuit vehicles, and these are these are um, common practice in other police services, and we wish to introduce them as a form of ensuring that the integrity of the organisation is correct. And in doing so, we may come across then information or intelligence which okay uh, and, and i hear your response and I, I don't want to interrupt but i hear your response and i've limited time if you're talking about a cooperative approach well, um, did you consult with gsoc in advance of making the statement around the anti-corruption unit what was your engagement well, with gsoc no, well, given that they are the independent body to oversee and guard and wrongdoing what was the level of engagement you had with well, them? At, at present, they're the independent body to investigate public complaints. I, I still have a responsibility for the investigation of crime, and that would include crime committed... I understand by, that, but I'm asking, did you consult with GSOC no, in relation I, to the establishment of this unit? No, because I feel it's an important element of securing, um, in effect, the integrity of the organisation. Well, I would see that as, as a mistake. And that's my opinion. I would, have, I would have thought that consulting with GSOC would have been something you would have done before you established this unit. And given the, the serious issues that they've raised in recent days, I think that adds to it. But that's my opinion, and you have your view, and we leave that there. Can, I do want to raise one issue with you, or one case, which uh, I spoke to the chair about this in advance. I don't want to, to name the individual, even though it's a case that was in the public domain. It was before the courts, and I think that the case was dropped. And it was in relation to uh, a young woman that was a civilian that worked in on Garda Síochána that was arrested over alleged fraud in relation to sick leave. So without getting into the name, I'm sure you're aware of the case. Yes. Yes. How many cases would there have been of uh, civilians or indeed even members of Garda Síochána that would have been arrested uh, for suspected fraud in relation to sick notes? And this was a small number. I take it sick notes as well. How many times would that have happened in the force under your commander, indeed, in, in, in recent years? And is that normal practice? Is there not HR issues that deal with these issues? Um, well, um, I've seen that ma I have seen the reports in that matter, indeed. I have to report further to the policing authority in respect of that. And, and having uh, looked at the matter, I think that the investigation into it was well founded. It was reported then to the DPP and they examined that matter and, and found it fit then also for prosecution. So this did go through an investigative process, but it also went through a, a process of external examination by the prosecution authority. And in fact, sufficient that they felt that there was a criminal case to answer.
Well, but I'm asking, is it peculiar that rather than going through HR mechanisms, that somebody would be arrested on the basis of sick leave notes? And I'm reading from the examiner, Mick Clifford, I think was the journalist that dealt with this, where he talks about disturbing questions that arise in this case, that this individual made a complaint of bullying within Store Street Garda Station, uh, and within three weeks of making a complaint of bullying, she then gets arrested for sick leave notes. And notwithstanding what you've said in terms of how this was investigated, the case, the charges were dropped in court. Um, so it's been through the courts now. There was no, uh, the charges weren't stood up and they fell apart. The case fell apart essentially. So it does seem to raise questions in relation to a lot of people on the face of it would ask genuinely, how could it be the case that a, an individual would be arrested before they would be questioned or would have gone through normal HR processes? Um, and it would be all the more peculiar, would it not, if the individual makes a complaint of bullying. In fact, I think as well, the guards that arrested her were known to her, which is also something that's not international practice. So there, there seems to me to be, notwithstanding what you've said, issues here. And I'm asking, is it something that you personally are, are of the mind to examine? Those elements of, of, of that issue that are in the public domain that would be of concern to people. Well, there undoubtedly are, are learning points in the investigation, and that, came, and, and that becomes very apparent because, obviously, then, uh, the, matter, the, uh, the matter was discharged before even um, it was heard before jury. So there were points of law and the manner in which evidence was obtained. So those are learning points for us. But may I say that um, we have no record of a complaint of bullying or harassment there, or none can be found. Uh, may I say. Um, so, so you have uh, done an examination of this, and if you, if you have that at hand, I would um, have you. Well, have you examined the claims that have been made by this individual? Well, this is also all, also subject to uh, public complaint and complaints made by GSOC. So, uh, material that we're putting together is obviously for the information then also of GSOC, and and in part, um, I have to wait as well for uh, for GSOC to make their recommendations. But there are obvious learning points for us around the process that was engaged in. But at the same time, uh, I think it was uh, an investigation which was based on uh, very reasonable grounds for pursuing it. And, and that matter then was reported and was examined externally to Angarda. Okay, and a more general point on this, and I'll finish and I have one more question to ask in relation to Garda numbers, but on a more general point, uh, what's an exit survey? I've seen this mentioned a couple of times. Are you aware of what that is? So an exit survey would be normal civil service practice where individuals as they leave the organisation would be, there would be a conversation with them around the reasons for leaving to see if there are system based issues or organisational based issues that should be, that should be brought Thank to you Mr morning. Nugent and in relation to Store Street Garda Station, um, if you don't have the information at hand, uh, could it be forwarded on, onto this committee in relation to exit surveys that have been completed by civilians who work in that particular Garda Station? Uh, how many complaints of bullying or issues of bullying would have been made? Um, I'll, I'll take that issue aside. I mean, I think there are privacy issues here as well. Like, just a survey is it's very particular to the individual as opposed to a generic survey. So I'd have to take that offline and assess whether it's possible but to... But Mr Newton, I would imagine the whole point of an exit survey is that you can establish patterns. Oh, no, I, 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 I so I'm just not asked, looking for the names of individuals. No, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not just that either. I'm saying, Deputy, I'm trying to see how we can provide the information you're looking for. We can certainly look away to see whether there were patterns there that related to bullying and harassment. Okay. And I'm, I'm not saying they were, I'm saying this was reported no, I and I'm only asking that. the question. And I'm so. saying we can take that issue offline and we can assess if, that, if, if there is something that we can come back. We'll come back to the committee one way okay. or the other. And my final question is in relation to new recruits for this year. Yeah. Again, um, it was reduced from 800 to 600. Now, given that we have competing demands for resources, we have in Drogheda, as we know, uh, very clear challenges in relation to shootings and robberies, uh, we dealt with an issue here as well, and we had it in our periodic report where we had a uh, very senior Gardaí concerned about the reopening of Step Aside Garda Station, uh, and yet that still seems to be going ahead, and yet we have what's going on in Drogheda and other parts of the country where there's a demand for more resources. How is it the case that we went, went from 800 to 600, given that there's a demand for increased capacity in areas where we have very serious crimes? Um, well, um, as 
as I've said earlier, the concentration this year was on the workforce modernisation to displace 500 uh, experienced guardy into, into frontline duties, be it detective duties or uniform type duties. Plus then, the additional 600 uh, new probationary guards also uh, employed, but we will have a cessation of about uh, 300 this year. And so, but that's a net increase in this year. But why would you use it from 800 to 600? Well, that, 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 was also, that was also in respect of affordability issues as well, to live within our budget of 1.76. So would you have preferred to have got the 800? Is well, it that you didn't I, I have think, the, the, the resources? I, I, well, uh, I was given the budget and, I've, and I've, I've, I've planned in terms of our recruitment to stay within that. To stay so you had to reduce budget. the 800 to 600 because you didn't have the budget to recruit so the, 800? The, the, um, the, there were choices that I had to make in terms of recruitment, and that those are driven by, by budgeting factors, yes. OK, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just to clarify, one thing just came up, and I'm just not sure, maybe public or not sure, the issue of GSOC and complaints to GSOC. Does that cover civilian members of the civilian employees as well as...? No, it, it doesn't, no. GSOC um, are for members, sworn members. Sworn, sworn members. Was that relevant to your issue, the person you were talking about? Was no, I didn't go to GSOC, no. I didn't go to GSOC, no. the case you were talking about. No, no. no. But, uh, not I, I, I believe there's a, there's a public complaint now has been made to GSOC about the actions of, in respect of the of investigation. Of an attested officer. Party, I think, wasn't it? Uh, uh, it may be, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just want so civilians can't be reported as only the they, they can't. They, they're not investigated by GSOC, no. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Deputy Catherine Connolly. I mean, Michael, I guess Falcherov, I guess Falcherov Galera, I guess Gaharia, Revan Commissioner Nua, I guess Guim Gahra, Earth or the Roll, Tom Widjig Brahart, Tom Nagardi Brahart, I guess Nis Tobakti, Tom Winter Nachirig Brahart, Con Balok Nua, a husband. Just I wish you the best in your new and, and the Gardi are dependent on you, but the people more importantly are dependent on you. And we're here to look at your accounts. <coughs> and there are many other issues that are for the Justice Committee and not, not for here, so I'm going to just stick with the accounts. And is this called a clear audit, Chair, with significant risks? Uh, on the accounts, on the, uh, the matters that I'm raising are uh, other matters. Okay. The, the, the accounts are clear. Are, the accounts are clear, but then there, uh, within the accounts yourself, Commissioner, you've raised significant financial risks that are outlined. Yes. So, so the questions today, I mean... Trust is trust and accountability, and we've been here with Templemore, which I'm not going back on. We've had the Morris Tribunal, 70 million, Charlton, O'Higgins. In my three years in the Dáil, it's been bookended by two reports. I began with O'Higgins, which I read in detail, and Charlton. And so there have been serious issues in relation yes. to accountability. So within that background, th these accounts, so there are significant financial risks. So the first question in relation to the audit process, and we know that the internal process prior to this wasn't really allowed to do its function, certainly in relation to Templemore, and issues emerged. Can you, as the accounting officer, tell us that the audit function, the internal audit function, and the audit committee are all functioning, they're meeting regularly, and everything is in order? Uh, well, uh, yes, meet regularly, and, uh, as I would, and um, my view of that is that it is uh, working correctly. Yeah. Uh, I take um, a close interest in that and I, yes. and I attend the meetings as Commissioner, in effect representing uh, the management side so, to so the membership fa of the factually, audit committee. Factually, the, the, that committee is meeting, that audit committee, the reporting structures are working yes. and, and you're, you're, you're happy with that, you're satisfied with that? Yes. Okay. And then in relation to the significant risks on page five, property and evidence management. And Mr. Nugent mentioned, I, I don't think he intended to be flippant, but he was referring to a proper, uh, property difficulty that arose 10 years ago. This is serious with reputational risk for the Gardaí if there isn't a proper system in place. I think of McCabe, I think of the Higgins report, and I think of a computer going missing. You know, so that's just one example. So you, okay. there's a new system now in place. Yes, and, okay. and, and if I could offer some reassurance, that system went live in uh, the quarter three of 2017. Good, I understand that. And rolled what? out entirely across the organisation. Lovely. And, and that's our management system. There Lovely, that's in place now everywhere. Yes. Okay, and has a review taken place of that to see how effectively it's working? So the, the head of internal audit would, would look at property um, 
property as part of his audits as he visits districts and divisions and stations. Okay. Yes. So it, just one second now. So it's coming under audit. So I'm saying audit would do would would carry out would give a further reconfirmation okay. that everything is working. Well, properly. I'll go back to Mr. Harris now in relation to this new system because obviously it's fundamental, isn't it, in relation to property that's going to be used in evidence or not? Yes. That there's a proper system in place. Are you satisfied that that system is now working? And if so, how are you satisfied? Has there been a look back? It's there since 17 and we're now in 19. Over the last two years, has there been a review and an assessment of how that's working to see if it's working properly? Um, well, I can't answer that question no. directly. I can only, um, what I know of is the examinations that internal audits have done on their divisional visits. So um, I, I, I don't know the actual evaluation that a project of this yeah. sort would entail, but yeah. we, I can find that out and report it. It would to be helpful. I don't mean to, I, I just, yeah. I, I'm, in, I'm innocent in, and not innocent, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm ignorant in relation to this, but I'm delighted there's a new system in place. So the next question, is it working? How do we know it's working? Well, I, it, well it will, um, and I presume, uh, but I will find out, it will yeah. be subject to post-implementation review. That's so that, that, that would that's be part of the project hear, yeah. management and we, we can supply that. Okay, at this point we don't know if that's happened, yeah. but you'll come back. Okay, then in relation to just two, two, uh, two more general points, but just two specific things in relation to page 21, guard the mass, and it's an income, it's a receipt, and it's jumped six, significantly. Can you just, which is good, presumably it's an income for you, but what is that? It's gone from 523. Um, 523,000 to a million and a half. It's just a specific question that somebody might come back to. I'll continue on if you don't mind okay, while somebody right. is looking yes, for that. Okay. In relation to Galway, of particular interest, but it also happened in Kevin Street. Again, maybe somebody would come back. We have a very new welcome. Um, the station, and I'm not going to go parochial here at all about it, but there were significant changes and significant costs. And so the question arises, like with Children's Hospital and lots of other projects, why wasn't it foreseen? It's on page 15. Galway, amendments made to the original design required structural works. In addition, there were also other design changes to meet requirements for the Garda and so on. Again, really, if somebody could come back with a note, was there a... a, a a competitive procurement process in the beginning, and then after that, what happened, and what was the cost increase? It, it, I'm, I'm thinking of the children's hospital, a price is given and then it changes. It would seem that s some things arise, but it depends on what the changes were, and the, why they weren't foreseen, why they weren't included in the original design. Just as a, pass, a passing comment on that, I have no idea why it came out so close to the road in Galway. I couldn't let this pass without making a comment. There's absolutely no button room for a bus route, and it's a terrible pinch point, but that's just a practical matter. Okay, so you're going to come back with two, two notes in relation yeah, to so those. Yes. I think, again, part of, part of the overrun related to the environment in which the contractor found themselves. So I use Kevin Street as an example that I'd be particularly familiar with. So th they would have had difficulties uh, in, in delivering on the contract where they would have had works that went beyond what was yeah, originally envisaged. I, no, I, Mr Nugent, I can read that from the little note. Yes. What I want to know is why it wasn't envisaged and how much did it cost? Well, again, Deputy... You're saying it just these, this, no, this saying, arises. I'm, what I said, Deputy, is that, that the control of this is managed on our behalf yeah. by the Office of Public Works. Okay, I our, see. Our responsibility I see. is purely around the payment of this. So okay. we, I, we don't have the no, detail that's around okay. the specifics. That's okay. I'll follow can, that up can I just answer yeah. the question yeah. on the mass that you raised, yeah. Deputy? Yes. Um, we, we'll have to come back on that. I, mean, I can yeah. only assume we have more revenue coming in from the um, from the various um, mobile phone providers who are using services, but I'll, I will revert with that's okay. more detail I, I, on that. Thank you. I'll follow up with Office of Public Works separately about the other matters, sure. so that's fine. Just going back again to reputation and learning, and this yes. lovely word learnings, which I detest, but because I don't know what it means really, learnings, but in, in any event, fixed penalty charges and the breadth test. Okay. Yes. That's an ongoing, you have that down here in your report as a significant risk to reputation and a significant risk financially. Where are we with that? Your note tells us. That so many cases were taken, just let me get it. I, I, don't, I want to get the figure because it was extraordinarily high. Yeah. Fixed charge notice. 
so on page five. So there was an examination of the summonses. 146,865 cases were found to have committed offences, and that was incorrect. Can you remind us again what was incorrect about it before I come on to the update in relation to appeals? So, um, in, respect, in respect of this matter, as you, as you say, it was, um, we identified between 2006 and the 7th. Yeah, it's all laid out there, so my question yeah. is just in, in 146,865 cases inaccurately taken or incorrectly. Just, I, I've actually forgotten the point of how they were, why they were taken inaccurately. Um, it, the, um, they were issued without the opportunity to pay an FCM. Beg your pardon? Uh, fixed, fixed charge notice. Yeah, but what was incorrect about it? They were all incorrect. They, they, they went straight to summons as okay. opposed to having the opportunity to thank avail of the fixed charge. Thanks notice. very much. Thank you. I'd forgotten that. And so when they went to court then, there was so many, uh, a penalty was imposed in 14,700 cases. Were the others all discharged or what happened? Yeah. There are various stages. Some of them were discharged. No, so no. 14,700 was left. Yeah. But of all the other ones, of the big sum, were they just discharged? No, no, there was various different issues I happened see. with them. So okay. some of them, some of them didn't make it to court. Some of them, there were, there were some, the, the, the summons weren't served. Yeah. In some cases, they're still, they were, they were still pending and before the courts at that okay. particular time. So there was a, 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 a variety of different responses accounting for those. Yeah. What we did know was that that, that number of fourteen thousand, they had been concluded in the court and they were the uh, ones with that were dealt with incorrectly and they were the ones we had to deal with. Okay. Other ones we were able to put a stop on. I understand. So the 14,000 ended up in court. Correct. They, and they you're working concluded. your way through those now Correct. and you're appealing Correct. them with the consent Correct. of the person. Correct. And so there's over 2,000 already sorted out. Yes, it's that's right. 2,000, I think 200 have been done to date. So, we, have, we have issued uh, letters to all of those people. A number yeah. of them have been returned unserved okay. because people have moved from those addresses. Okay. So what we've done with those letters is we have issued them to the local district officer. Yeah. So he has to make inquiries as to where the people have moved to to try and so, pursue them through okay. that process. So of the 14,700, 2,274 have been dealt with and yes. you're working through the rest. Yes. Which yes. Have, yeah. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> the information based on what, the, the 29th of March 18 or the 26th of September 18? Like that, re that report was signed off a year ago. So what's the current position on that? The current like position... The, the, it, we, we're reading figures that are a year, a year old. So where are you on that 14,700 cases now? That's a, that's we a have year a, old information. We have um, a, another 2,000 cases are, are currently before the courts. Uh, I'm awaiting on court dates. There's a further meeting on the 20th of May... Uh, when we were, were working with the court system. So, uh, are you saying to me, since this figure was produced 12 months ago, the 2274 that we're reading, another 2,000 have been dealt with in the last 12 months? Um, I, I'd have to go back behind that and say, uh, for the 3,500 letters were issued. Yeah. Uh, and How many have been appealed or before the courts out of the 14,000? At, at the moment, we, we have issued 2,000 letters and, and they're the ones that are currently we're, we're awaiting appeal on those. And we're working on the court service to, because of the volumes, they have to be scheduled uh, for no, a particular I understand court that, date. On the 29th of March, this document was signed off by the accounting officer saying, at that date, a year ago, 2274 cases have been successfully appealed. That's a year, a year, 13 or 14 months old information. What's the position today? Okay. So, uh, out of the 14,000, how many have been appealed? We, we have um, issued, successfully appealed. issued a further 3,500 letters. Yeah. Um, and those letters now uh, have, we, we have succeeded in, in um, pro processing them through the courts and to a scheduling stage now in the courts. So, if, we go, if we can go back just bef before yeah. that, when we issued the the, the, the 12,000 letters, uh, it was four, almost 5,000 letters were returned unserved. So then it was quite, a, quite an intensive process. What does that mean? It means that when we sent the letter out to the house where the registered owner uh, resided, they were no longer there. They had moved house. So if somebody lived on 
on, on Main Street, Templemore. When we sent the letter back out to them post the conviction, they were no longer at that address. Yeah, were you not able to get the address from road safety, the licensing? Yes, so, so we, we, that's the process that we had to go through. Then we had to go and check the driver file to see whether there updates. In, in cases, the, 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 the original cars were no longer uh, their property. Um, and it was, it, it's quite a, a detailed uh, uh, you know, process. It's not as simple as saying I know know, that. the address all, back in 2010. All, 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 all I'm just saying is this note says two years ago, or three years ago actually, May 2016, these ah. issues came to light. Yes. 14,000 cases came to light three years ago. And only 2,000 of them have been successfully appealed before. Is it, should this rate alone it'll take a decade? How many but, people have lost their jobs in the meantime as a result of this? Well, there's no evidence that anybody has lost their jobs. They could have. Well, the, 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 there is no evidence that anybody has lost their jobs. Okay. And, and we'll put that in the what record. we have found is that in a lot of cases that we've written out to people, we've got no response. Okay. But so then we have, to, we have to go to the next step of that, which is a personal call you know, to these people. Then, where the, where, the one, where the other ones that come back and they're unserved, we then have another process. So it, it is quite time-consuming, and we're talking about numbers. I, I, I mentioned there that 4,843 letters were returned by on post as unserved. So we have to go. They were all then sent out to local district officers to begin that individual process. In, in other cases, then there was a considerable number of people who didn't respond at all, who gave who gave no. Uh, uh, um, <coughs> response to the letter that they got as to whether they wanted to appeal, uh, appeal or not. Uh, and then, separate to that again, we have brought the, the, the 2,200 through the courts. We have another 2,000 scheduled to go through You know how many the people lost their licences as a result of this? Because the, the penalty points were imposed. Obviously, on average, a significant percent to put them over the 12. A number of people must have lost their licences. Do you well, know, or do you have that information? I don't have it here with me, no, with but me now, it. but we would have it, yes. You would know their driving record. How many of those fines shove the people over the 12 to Well, we can, we can provide that information for okay. you. Okay. But what we do need to recall uh, uh, in this as well is quite a number of the offences that we're, we're dealing with here were not penalty point offences. They were revenue offences. So, you know, it, it is, while, while there are numbers uh, and large numbers here, a number of the offences were not penalty point offences. So we'd have, yes, we're fines. You, you need, we, need, we need a detailed report on this. Provide, this is a three-year-old issue that came to light three years ago. We have information signed off over a year ago, and I don't get much of a feel of an up-to-date in the last 12 months. And I'm concerned, you know, I don't know why it's taken so long. I understand the difficulties, let us come okay. back. But in fairness to the people, you, you have to make an extra effort. I know it's well, Everybody got a letter. Time. Everybody was written well, to, and, everybody written because and it's, it's the next stage of that. People didn't, either didn't respond, or we weren't able to reach out. To reach I know. Out all, all, all I'm saying, I conclude this: it's three years on. We will. There seems to be page. very slow. But yeah. Give us an up-to-date okay. in writing okay. on, on, on this topic, a, a current report, okay. and where we are. And, the, and you know, I, I can say no more today. Okay. Only send us on a report. Okay. Is that okay? But Sorry, Deputy Connolly, for that's cutting across. Would, an up-to-date would be very yeah. helpful in relation... Okay. The, the mistake was made by the Gardaí. Yes. The people were innocent in relation to this matter. That's important. Yes. And so the next point for this committee is the cost implications <coughs> yes. of the process. Mm -hmm. And so you've taken over 2,000 to the, to the appeal court. How much money has that... What are the legal costs to date? Or are there legal costs? Um, I'll have to provide that information to you, and I, I can't yeah. provide As I say, there is a yeah. further meeting at the, uh, on the 20th of May when, when, that, when the results of those but, will be made. Right. Right. And your request for compensation as a result no. of No, no. Fine. Just, again, it's, it's just in the context of this sure. committee. It shouldn't have happened. It did happen. You're dealing with it. But there has to be an end to it, yeah. and there has to be an update in relation to it. And the costs, what is it costing in terms of manpower, woman power, and to the legal legals down there. So let's, let's have an update on that. In relation to the breath tests and the huge significant discrepancy, of which I'm not going back on, that's a matter of record, where are we in relation to that? What improvements have been made? Have you now reconciled year data with the data recorded on the machines? Uh, yes, and um, the report that referred to that, we, we regularly brief the police and authority on that at the last public meeting. Um, the uh, Assistant Commissioner of Police uh, updated the, the authority on that matter. 
the recommendations. The policing authorities. Yes, the policing authority, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, and we are we made the, we made the necessary changes to make sure that doesn't happen again, uh, and. Uh, with far tighter record control around our systems and how we record breath tests. And this is all part then of ongoing um, examination of all our records around to make sure the accuracy, the, to improve the accuracy of our data. But we've had, you know, we had a specific examination of this, recommendations, and those recommendations have been actioned and they continue to be actioned in terms of process improvement and making sure that, in effect, you know, the cracks in the system which allowed this to happen on such a large scale are, aren't there now. Okay, thank you. I've finished. Just a final question. It's a personal interest again in relation to, I think it's the protection units for domestic violence and gender yes. violence. And they're being rolled out, and I welcome that. Yes. Where, where are the cost implications? Where do I see that in the accounts? Is that accounted for separately, number one? And number two, are there sufficient funds to roll out the objectives that you have in relation to the protection units? Uh, well, um, uh, primarily the costs are there. Obviously, we have to staff that, and that, that comes with. No, I understand all that, but where, where would it be but, reflected? Just well, it be uh, refle we, we, we could draw up the specific costs, but there's been costs, you, you know, we'd see specific costs as, uh, around vehicles. There's been some estate issues as well, and then uh, ICT uh, issues in terms of support for them. And so we would need to provide a specific figure for that. It's not broken out. Our accounts are not broken out to that level, Deputy, in terms of the okay. sorts of material that's there. And that's one of, I think, the Department of Public Expenditure have been pushing us to, to provide some of that greater granular detail. So the accounts, as they appear, don't get down to that, to that as it stands. But okay. as the Commissioner said, we can, we can take that offline okay. if that's a particular issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the next speaker indicated was Deputy Aylward. Uh, like my colleagues, I'd like to wish uh, Commissioner Harris the very best. Uh, uh, we've had a lot of interaction with uh, commissioners over the last number of years, and I think we all need a strong, fair, trustworthy, and an efficient force. And, and yeah, we are part of our daily lives, everyone's daily lives. So I want to wish you the best uh, in the years ahead, and, uh, and the force as well. And that's a lot of the controversies that we had are, are behind us now, and that we can move on to. Uh, uh, a more better force, I suppose. That's the thing. I just want to start with your sundry items there uh, on appropriation aid. I want to ask you about the Garda College receipts, um, uh, 2018, 700,000, 18, 608, and 19, 300,000. Just what are, what are uh, the Garda College receipts? What are they? Just to explain them. Primarily restaurant-related uh, receipts, so, so money that's taken from the, from the shop, from the restaurant, from the use of the services in the college. So, and that money is put into general. It comes back into comes back into standard right. appropriations. So, it's money that's earned from the shops, etc. That's uh, correct. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And we had a lot of controversy down there about the shops <laughs> and things, so we won't go back there. Uh, I just want to ask you now about the fire, firearm fees. Um, there, they just went from very low in 2019 up to 10, 10, uh, 10 400,000. That's 10 million. Ago. What's that? Can you explain that to me? And the firearm fee is there on the appropriation in aid. Yeah, the, the, the firearms fee, they're not an annual cost. They're a cost that's done every couple of years. So, that as such, the cost would not be, it would not be flat. So but it increased an awful lot from, I'm just looking at it there, 2017 up to 2019. Why is that increase so much in one year? That's what I'm asking. You know, the, the major jump there. Yeah, four the, times, five times what it was cost every other year. Why is it so much in 2019? That's what I'm asking. The, the, the firearm fees are on a, on a three-year cycle. So th there is a bulk year. There, there is one year every three years which we get a lot of fees in. And that's why it's reflected. I think it goes back to when we first started issuing the. Sorry, can you explain what a firearm fee is? That was a cost to buy arms. Is that what it's, it's, it's a license. It, there's an annual cost. You have a license for a firearm, and that. That's the general public at office. Yes. Oh yeah, I yes. understand that. Sure, yeah. I know that. We're and, a and, farmer. I know yeah. shotguns and things like that. So, yes. and, and that, that's the cost that that's that that's about. Oh sorry, I was and taught it, as the firearms no. within the police force. So, oh sorry. No, 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 no. It's a firearm, and because that's when, that was originally renewable every year. And then the, when the licensing regime changed, it was renewable every three years. But it's not all of them are every three. So if you buy one yeah, this year, it's in know. three years, and next year it's three years from that. Yeah, the only reason why I asked is, is the sum increased so much in, in yeah. over four or five years. Why? Well, that's all I'm asking. And it, it, it's just related back to when the... the okay, the, the, that's okay. Safety cameras, and uh, these were mentioned already. I just want to ask you two questions about safety cameras. Uh, uh, 
Um, there was talks about body cameras for each, each uh, policeman individually, each police person, body cameras. Is that a, a, a policy for the future or is it something you're looking at and um, what kind of costs would be involved? We see reports on it in papers and that about having a body. It's another police force, I think, in England in particular. And uh, I think the, the Gather Representative Association of Cells would be very anxious that this would come on stream for every reason, for law reasons, for safety reasons, and then for proof and witness reasons, etc., etc. So, what is the policy on uh, the police force on uh, body cameras? I call them. Uh, well, we, um, our policy would be to introduce them. Uh, we need legislative and uh, legislation to enable that. That's been working, worked through, and it's one of the recommendations from the Commission of Future Policing. Um, and so, we'll need legislation. I think when we look to purchase equipment, one of the facts for us is that we will be issuing uh, smartphones which have a, a, a video facility and rather than buy another uh, camera, we may actually uh, use our, our own, our existing um, mobility uh, mobile that we've issued. So the, the, the costs, um, it, we have to just decide what way we're going to go with these, but we have some time in that the legislation has to be passed as well. But if we're, if we're doing an outrun of, of 10,000 odd um, smartphones, which you can obviously record video on, then that may be an alternative rather than a, a bespoke camera. That, I, I want that examined. Up what kind of cost do we know any? What kind of cost well, to roll the, it out? The, the, Say even for 10,000 to roll it out. Well, the, the, cameras them, the, the, the cameras themselves um, are, are going to be in the mid-hundreds. Um, but the, the aspect then is beyond that is the storage and how long material is stored for. And so that, that's actually where some of the costs are. And that depends whether it's, you know, 30 days or a year. And, you know, you, you really start to rack up costs there. And also then your instructions on when they're being used so as well to record. And, and get, would uh, mobiles, would, uh, would, uh, could, if they were stolen, would there be problems there? For, we say, well, it, it, it's you know, a whole issue. Such a, the whole issue then is about the, the secure download and then the security then of that as an evidential package that you can then produce oh, would that to a mean criminal If there was some uh, fractures or something that I got at the window, that this camera would be on the whole time, that to take, um, yes. you'd, you'd have a, a, a feel a of well, what's going on, what's well, even happening on the ground, and that you, whoever would be sitting watching would know exactly well, uh, from well, witness it, in court in future. Well, it's it, just it, uh, it, it provides another record of an event and that can that can not only just be you know some form of confrontation whatever shape that might be but more importantly uh, it can also be the first report of domestic abuse uh, a first report of a serious sexual assault but also in contentious situations it can provide to um, GSOC uh, an independent eyewitness to the whole event and it's been very useful in other jurisdictions in in actually vindicating um, uh, officers, police officers in other jurisdictions as, in the manner in which they behaved. So uh, I know GRA are attracted to it for that uh, reason. It's spoken of formally by you know, neighbouring associations and it does ease up, it does ease the pressure on individual members whenever they're complained about because they know then there's this record of the event. Uh, but beyond that there are very strong pub, uh, you know, protection reasons and policing of sensitive areas where it can make a real difference. Have you already those cameras on, 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 on the police cars? Uh, there, are, there are some cars which are fitted with AMPR, uh, with automatic number plate recognition. Not, a, not every, not every, not no, every, not, 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 not every vehicle. That's, that's the, more the roads policing vehicles and then that alerts uh, vehicles which uh, um, uh, are, are on our uh, pulse system for various reasons. Would it, be, would it be the policy to roll that out to every square car in the future? Um, is it cost prohibitive? Uh, well, actually, as time goes on and the, and the technology becomes more commonplace, it does become more cost effective. Um, it's then that uh, you need to be sure that your database behind that then uh, is accurate as well. So there are, there, there, are, there, there are other issues just around the data and also data transmission as well. But the technology keeps on moving on. Things which were you know, expensive and, and, and prohibitive five years ago were becoming more and more... Um, actually um, uh, affordable and really doable in terms of just preventing crime, detecting crime and 
e even as it is at the moment, you know, if we have an incident, we try our best to flood that area with uh, AMPR vehicles to hoover up and identify any vehicles in the area. Can I ask you, Deputy Kelly, refer to CCTV on the programme for government? There was a commitment given by the government that they would put CCTV, especially on motorways, and I'm particularly talking about Kilkenny now because we have two motorways going through Kilkenny uh, Carlo, uh, and there's a lot of robberies which I say. Fly by night robberies, they come from Dublin or from Limerick and they come in and they're, they're obvious to have some local knowledge. They come off the motorways, uh, 20 minutes, half hour. They've done it in Orling Ford in North Kilkenny several times yes. and they're gone onto the motorway and they're back before they even get to know about they're back in Dublin or I'm not saying where, but some big city out. Yes. And um, I've asked, asked the Minister uh, for just several times about this CCTV, but it doesn't seem. What's your opinion on CCTV on junctions coming off the motorways and uh, well, the future? of they being provided? Well, I, I think maybe the route for, for this is also automatic number plate recognition, static cameras, uh, which are providing then a constant read of vehicles um, who are, are on the motorway and exiting and, and entering the motorway. Um, again, using other jurisdictions can give you information then, so if there is a suspicious vehicle, then you, but you need it again to have the software and the office sitting behind that that can analyse the data. Because it's not always that you'll know the number plate. All you'll know is the description of the vehicle, you know, a black Ford Focus. And the, your system needs to be able to look for black Ford Focuses moving at that so, time. So that you place. won't see, we won't see CTV on every junction coming off of motorways. We say the major motorways. We won't see that happening in the short term then. Or well, term. I think it, there's probably, um, there may well be a legislative issue um, around that as well that we need to address. But certainly, um, make a significant contribution around crime prevention, crime detection, and, um, and there is a pattern where crime gangs are obtaining vehicles, vehicles then that don't move for a number of, of months uh, and then reappear, and again, you can program your NPR to identify that as well. So, you know, they could, there's significant benefits in, a, in a, an NPR system. I would say it has to be targeted, though, towards where you think you've you're going to get reap benefits in terms of crime detection and prevention. I just want to ask you then, that brings us the pulse system, and we had OPW in just a month or two ago here, and we had questions about the pulse system and about the Gaddish Khan, and we know what happened before with the breath testing and, and, and the penalty fines, and is the pulse system that you have uh, in Phoenix Park, is it, up to, is it up to scratch? Is it efficient enough? Is it a modern-day system? Uh, computer-wise, um, you know, because we, we've had a lot of complaints about the pulse system, or is it, the, is it the expertise or the human resources that's available or that people are feeding it as the problem? Is the system or is the expertise on the ground that's feeding the pulse system uh, that if we have problems, that's where the problems lie? Um, well, the, the, the pulse system um, has, you know, people talk about pulse and it's gone, but it goes back a long time, but pulse has had, you know, uh, so release after release and, and addition after addition, uh, and even um, in, in going through the preparation for our, the Schengen process, we've had to do a huge rebuild of the of the um, of the pulse uh, system itself. But I think, at the view of our uh, our own ICT people, is that there, we may have to consider moving to some other system, migrating to some I other system. I just see your ICT, your ICT uh, investigation management system. Is that a different uh, system to Pulse now? Is that, uh, is that uh, a new uh, system yeah. was it, was it within the gather force? The, 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 it's different than Pulse, is it? Yeah, the investigation management system, specific system, where uh, if you have an investigation, then you load up your statements, you load up the actions that you've taken, all the various inquiries, and that gives oversight, but also gives a framework for the member to conduct their investigation against the specific crime types, but also it will allow us then to have more information about um, who is offending and where the offending is happening, and that would be good for our analytical work, but also we can see um, and inspect you know, of the problem of car insurance and fraud and uh, these um, set-up accidents. You can identify, um, because it is happening right across the country, but the our investigation management system is a national system when it rolls out as well. That will uh, identify people who are very unlucky in their driving and have you know, 20 accidents a year. It will identify cars which are also very unlucky and are in a dozen accidents a year. And, and that would be a, a real... And that's a complete different system than the police says, completely, completely separate. Different different. Yeah. Is this based in, in, in Finnish Park as well? Well, it, yes it is, but it is linked into it uh, because we want... 
you know, information that's on a, on a, uh, in a uh, investigation management system, which is relevant then for pulse should, should go across so an individual's under investigation for, you know, some sort of serious offence, for instance. Sounds like a very efficient system. Uh, that's what, how long will it take to roll it out completely? The investigation management system then, till 2020. Uh, yeah, it'll be the end of 2020. It's already in, in, in Waterford. Uh, and it is now rolling out into that southeastern region, so your own area in Kilkenny, Carlow, and that's the next phase of that. And there is a scheduled rollout. I'm only a few miles from Waterford as well. <laughs> you know, I don't know how Waterford and Kilkenny are, but I'm only a few miles from the border. So uh, uh, the, it's, it has been implemented in Waterford, it's been rolled out in, in, in that wider area, and then before, between now and the end of 2020, it is intended that the vast majority of the entire country, some of the national units have also. Uh, been trained in it and has been rolled out. Okay, I'll you more questions. Just uh, the reserve force, the Gather Reserve Force, uh, you know, I didn't hear anyone mention it today. Uh, was you, you didn't mention any numbers or figures. Uh, do you, do you uh, support about the Gather Reserve Force? Do you think they are playing an important part in the system and uh, uh, should they be increased or should they be kept at the level they are at? Or well, uh, is this a step of stone into the Gather, gather Shikara itself? Is it being used as that? Yes, and uh, uh, that's correct. It, and it's a good opportunity for those who may be considering um, a career in Garda Shikana to be exposed to what the police work is like and whether they'd be interested in it or not. But even beyond that, we are committed to it. We are committed to expanding uh, the size of the Garda Reserve. We have to finish off a piece of work around the strategy for it going forward. How many is in the Garda Reserve Force? There's 500 at the moment. We just recently recruited a further um, 100. And um, the experience from other jurisdictions is that it is a good route for uh, those less well represented in the main force to see what the organisation is like and a route for them to join through. Uh, uh, have, you any, through. have you any statistics on the percentage to actually join the Garda force from the reserve? Is that, or is that, you know, I'm only asking that, it's only a general question. I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. It, 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 Any time I'm at one of the past now parades, there's always a few yeah, who, yeah. who have been in the, what's the, the target, reserve. What's the target for the reserve forces? At, um, 2,000. Yeah. 2,000. So we're at 500. So we have a big, we have a big recruitment, um, we have a big recruitment plan in respect of the Guard Reserve. But we see that as important around uh, visibility and particularly at crucial times. And that's what our strategy wants to reflect. You know that we can give people certainty about when they're required and what duties they're required to do, and also then. Um, you know the hours that we will expect in return to for be mostly the community, training. To be most community police, not the reserve force. We, uh, we would we would envisage that it's very much aligned with community policing and maybe high-profile events. So provide, helping to provide numbers in respect of sporting events or concerts, etc. But yeah. uh, but also then to help to deal with the nighttime economy um, and community policing. Right. And just the police force at the moment is at 14,000. Uh, is it a little is it over 14,000? Over 14,000. And is it vision to go to 16,000? I think it's is it over? 15. 15 over what term? Uh, 15 by 2021. And if you had 15,000, would that be sufficient to, we say, to police the country without any, uh, you know, with, with Brexit coming, perhaps there be, could, could be other problems here. We could have, would 15,000 be sufficient enough to handle that if, if uh, I'm only mentioning Brexit just because it's yeah. on the horizon? And well, uh, well um, we're, under, we're under stresses at the moment, but, you know, like, we're a can-do organisation, and so we have to deal with these matters. At 15,000, uh, that'll be the strongest we've been uh, ever, but bear in mind also then that we have also will have 4,000 guard staff, and part of that deployment, a good portion of that deployment, 1,500 of that, is is to allow other experienced guard members to be displaced out to the front line as well. So you know we will have a strong then real front line contingent, whatever that might be, because that's detective duties as well as 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 uniform policing, and, and we'll be in a strong place then. And I think. Uh, you know, there's pressures on us, and we want to grow certainly the armed support unit, but also then some of our national uh, units as well need further supplement, uh, as well as community places. And are we recruiting enough? We say we, we mentioned already 800, 600 this year, yep. because with retirements and you know leave people leaving the force, is there any standing still where by just having 600? Should we have it up to 800? To I know there's well, budgetary, I know there's budgetary constraints. You've mentioned it already, but should we be looking at maybe 800 to 1,000 recruits a year just to to increase that number? Well, um, 1,000 would be uh, a very stretching number, given that uh, um, 
you know, we, we have a good sense now of how quickly we can expand. I think 800 is, is, what, is, is what we can do, and, and that creates a lot of that creates pressures as, uh, in doing that. But um, uh, no, I'm content that we follow the right course. The budget constraint was actually uh, my responsibility as accounting officer to stay within 1.76 billion, and that's the way I cut up the pie. But I still think that was also then tactically viable in terms of concentrating this year on the uh, Garda staff to displace experienced people out on the ground. Okay. And that, just yes, one more question, and it's already been, so I'm not going to go over again by different command, it's about GSOC and the relationship with the Gardaí, because yeah. it's in the papers this week, we've yep. read all about it, and the complaints from GSOC. What is the relationship between ourselves, between the Gardaí Garda and GSOC? Well, I, I is it a good relationship? Have you entered to and fro? I mean, the no. establishment, they're supposed to be looking at what's happening in the Gardaí. Well, uh, the reports I, I, of the I, paper didn't sound good, like it didn't look good, it didn't good well, look, I, I, good I, I reading. Was, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but I would say uh, we have a very good relationship with, with GSOC, um, and certainly for my part and the part of my senior team, uh, we very much want to work hand-in-hand -hand with them. Uh, none of us wants to see anyone who's an, in an Garda Shikana engage in any form of wrongdoing. We want to see public complaints properly investigated and uh, brought to conclusion as expeditiously as possible, but also we are determined to make sure that those who engage in you know, thing, criminality, inappropriate associations, uh, use of drugs, all of that is, is um, proactively looked at and combated, and uh, I want to play uh, my part in that as well. Was a reference really on the paper, just reading the papers, a reference that, you know, the Gardaí are investigating themselves, the superintendents are investigating personnel of their own, of their own, from their own force, which is probably not the ideal situation, and GSOC, this delegation that GSOC weren't aware of even some, some investigations that were going on, and they, yet they are supposed to be the bombersmen, they are supposed to be the body that's, that's supposed to be aware of any wrongdoing in the Gardaí Chicana, which I understand is in every force, and in every walk of life we have wrongdoing, and people have to weed something. We it out. I'm just saying, what do you think of that report? And, you know, do you accept that the Gardaí should be investigating themselves or that GSOC should be involved in some way or in some role to play in uh, disciplinary matters within the Gardaí Well, they, Well, they do have a role to play in that they, they investigate um, complaints. Um, and, and, and also, they, they, but they said they weren't aware of some. The, the, some they, 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 they weren't all... aware of some. That's what they were saying. At least that's what the report said. Well, well, well I, I suppose. These are, these are matters that um, uh, we've uncovered our, ourselves as Angarda Shikana, probably through intelligence or through um, uh, reporting from within the organisation, and we follow through on those investigations. And I, I would point to the very high standard that those investigations have been um, conducted to. Uh, like many investigations that have taken forward have been successful investigations and have been brought to a proper conclusion in terms of bringing matters before the courts. And that work carries on. And I know that uh, GSOC have been informed of that work that, that is uh, ongoing at this moment as well. Okay. And Deputy Farrell, did you? Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, Commissioner, you're very welcome. Um, I'll just start where Deputy Aylward left uh, in terms of redeployment. Um, I read an awful lot of commentary about your plans to de redeploy uh, individuals from effectively desk duty to frontline positions. Is, would you put a percentage on that in terms of what you've done so far, what you plan to do? Um, the, the target for this year is uh, 500. Um, we've completed 250 last year, um, and so by the end of the year we'll be uh, in effect halfway, halfway through that. Okay. And in terms of the civilianisation, as you referred to, or the professionalisation, as your predecessor referred, um, that process is ongoing, I assume. And is there an upper limit to the professionals that you plan on bringing into on Garda Siakona in terms of civilians? Well, um, well, we refer to them as Garda, Garda staff, and um, uh, the upper limit, uh, which has been set uh, for me, is 4,000. Okay. Uh, but um, when we get to an organisation of 15,000 and 4,000 plus 2,000 uh, Garda Reserve, then we need to actually, at that stage, take stock and recalibrate, mm. because there, more, there, there may be more that can be done. And uh, why I say that is that um, it, 
our, my responsibility with the budget is actually to maximise the policing impact. And so at 15 four, that, that proportion may have to change further. Okay. Uh, in terms of that, I, I, I try not to stray too much into policy. I, I appreciate that's the job of the, the, the Justice Committee. I was a member for six years. So um, just in terms, though, of, of things like forensics, which, you know, heretofore, insofar as I'm aware, is being done by sworn members, um, and I just wanted to see clarity on, on certain roles that may not necessarily need sworn members, and thus save yes. the taxpayer money ultimately yes. um, uh, um, and, and provide for public confidence because the sworn member is off doing yes. uh, guarded duties, which I think is more appropriate. So just a, a short comment on that, please. Well, um, that is one area, but it's probably one of the most difficult areas because um, crime scene investigation um, is, uh, requires experience and the ability to deal with repeatedly dealing with some with very difficult scenes and dealing with that in a very professional and objective manner so that you're uh, obtaining the best evidence. It's difficult work. It is an area which could be subject to workforce modernization, but we need to think that one through very carefully in particular because it can take a number of years, maybe up to three years for an individual to become sufficiently proficient in that area of work. So it's a possible, uh, and but it's only a possible if we carefully think through how it might be done. Is there a legislative requirement um, for, from the Oireachtas perspective in order to facilitate something like that? Or are you happy enough that there are, well, to the best I, I, of your knowledge, any well, impediments to that? Um, I don't believe there's any impediments, but I think the, some clarity would need um, uh, in respect of uh, my employees, be it guard of members or guard of staff, their ability to you know, hold, a, hold a firearm or uh, retain a firearm in their uh, legal possession on behalf of me, ammunition, explosives, so that they can properly transmit um, exhibits, move exhibits, etc. Okay, thank you for that. I'll, I'll really quickly go through some, some general observations um, in terms of the financial information provided in Appendix A. Um, maintenance of guard of premises um, has the budget for that, and I appreciate this crossover with OPW's budget, but the maintenance for that has dropped significantly for 2019 based on the figures provided for 17 and 18. Is there a particular reason for that? I think we'd like more money in that space, and it's something we've been working with the department as part of the estimates campaign. I think when you look at 500 plus uh, premises around the country, the actual amount of money that's available to us is, is a 600,000. Now, um, Mr. Nugent, I, I, I think I'm right in saying that the OPW covered the cost of some of the work, so we're not talking about no maintenance or 642,000 euros of maintenance being done, which clearly is a drop in the ocean with 500 premises to look after. So, is, is there a certain percentage of, of what that 600 is versus what the overall spend on maintenance is? Uh, I, I don't have the figure, the Office of Public Works okay. figure, Deputy. Maybe but not a figure, but just, just a notion. I, of I think we're, we can say just genuinely we just do not have you enough. Don't have we don't have enough on that. And why the drop case. from? 4.5 million in 2018 to 642,000. Uh, don't know the exact reasons for that, and again, perhaps we can okay. we can revert. On I'll that. move on. Thank you. Um, station services. What is station services in in, in context of expen uh, appendix A? So cleaning. Um, it's okay. that that type of. Material. That's fine. Thank you. Um, the capital build in A12 referenced. It, that's only divisional headquarters. Is that correct? There's yeah. no other. Yes, no that's other correct. Building. Thank you. Um, Firearms fees you covered already, Deputy Aylward's question. Um, appropriation and aid, Garda College receipts. Um, so, we were here before in relation to sports field, mm. shops, mm. boat clubs, mm. all sorts of different things. <coughs> um, and I have a few questions in relation to that that I want to just briefly address. And I think it would be helpful. In terms of... Um, there, there was one issue which I don't have clarity on. There were European funds sitting in a, in a bank account at one point, which I believe were for training purposes, which, if I'm not mistaken, Chairman, you may recall, you may assist if you recall, um, may not have been appropriately accounted for at the time of our review approximately two years ago. Uh, I'd like to know whether that review that has, on, has been undertaken, recommendations have been brought forward and you're working through them, which I welcome, 
uh, whether that uh, particular sum of money, whether the commissioner as accounting officer is satisfied that that has been accounted for appropriately. And interrelated to that, um, what is the delay with the transfer of lands from sports field to OPW? To the best of your knowledge, I appreciate it's not, you're not OPW. Um, and finally, um, in terms of internal audit, Commissioner, mm -hmm. um, I'm not an accountant. Uh, I, I, I was a member of the Justice Committee for six years. I'm a now a member of the Public Accounts Committee. I observed um, an awful lot of indecision, uncertainty, and I got the distinct impression as a, an independent observer or as a non-professional observer that I personally felt that the, that the resources that were being provided at that time to internal audit by Angarda Siakana was not sufficient in order to meet the task that was before them, primarily because it was such a mountain to climb. And I wonder now whether you personally, as the new commissioner since last year, are satisfied that internal audit and the nature of the uh, oversight function within Angarda Siakana is sufficiently robust to ensure that the issues that were highlighted to this committee and indeed to other committees in the last number of years will not reoccur. So maybe, Mr. Nugent, we could start with the two questions that I asked of you so, in relation to the European funds. Okay, so the European funds, the matter was reported to the European auditors uh, by the head of internal audit, and the issue was subsequently overtaken by a public interest investigation by GSOC. I don't have the outcome of that of that at the moment, but that's a process that, that continues. That's still ongoing. That we haven't heard back on, on, on the finalisation of that at this point. In relation to your question around the transfer of lands, um, the focus of my focus over the last since we, we started on this discussion about two years ago has been about resolving some of the other matters, the broader governance issues, the financial issues in the college, uh, before getting into the, the trickier areas of, of land transfer. Uh, the transfer of the playing fields, which are the, to remind uh, members, yeah. are the actual you know, football and hurling pitches part of things. And the contracts for the and transfer the of land. actually, Pardon? now that you say it, and the farmland. Well, I'm just talking here at the moment about purely about the, 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 the football and hurling pitches element, that the transfer of the, um, the contracts for those have, both been, have been signed by both parties, and we're literally just waiting for the title to be vested okay. in that, and that's okay. days away, as I understand okay, great. it. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, was that... In, in the context of, um, <clears throat> you recall, uh, it, it, part of the, 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 the external affair that you, you mentioned in, in regard to the, the European funds, the... Uh, boat club mm. transfers that occurred mm. between, I think, the shop or the sports field to the boat yeah. club. Has, has that matter also subject to the same? So, yeah, just my understanding was that, that GSOC took a broader public interest inquiry and looked Good. into the entirety of the issues that okay. were there. So that would include... I might that. ask the clerk then if it's possible, Mr Chairman, that we write to, um, to GSOC. Um, sorry, was it GSOC? GSOC, yeah. Yeah, GSOC in relation to that matter to inquire as to the status of their inquiry. I think it would be very interesting. Okay, I just asked the deputy, is it appropriate for you to what? ask the GSOC, can we get it through them, because GSOC are not before. I, Correct. Do a letter, do which we, is the right yeah, sequence. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, whichever, I, I understand so that's the... Yeah. Whichever is the correct sequence. Whichever sequence. is the more appropriate we, we, We'll do the, we, we can ask, get an update, whether yeah. it comes from you or GSOC, we'll work Thank, out thank you, Chair, that, that, that's okay. helpful. I, I, if you bear in mind, GSOC are entirely independent of me, and we'll be conducting this investigation independent of me. I, I, don't feel I would be enabled to yeah, ask them. Can ask. Okay, yeah. well, we can ask. That's all I'm okay. verifying. So, um, then, Commissioner, just in terms of resources of internal audit, robust uh, well, nature um, of oversight, etc. Uh, internal audit has received additional resources um, and the training that also that goes with that. Um, I've taken particular interest in ter internal audit. I think it's um, an essential element uh, for me and, and my responsibilities as, as a accountant, as accountant officer. Um, uh, I, would, I would like to see uh, greater emphasis more on thematic um, work as well, and uh, we're working through just what that might look like. So we pick an area of, of uh, the police and business, and we look at the risks in that and how those are being addressed, and maybe put this, you know, not just dealing with financial matters, but also dealing with, you know, the operational risks. 
um, and Garda Shikana policing is a risk business mm -hmm. and how we deal with those risks, identify them and deal with them is a very important okay. part of risk management and internal audit. And, you know, the, the two things are on a, a continuum with each other. So uh, I think actually there's more to be done and there's more that I would like okay. to see to be done as, as well. But as I say, um, I've made sure that the committee know that they have my, they have my full support. I attend to answer for the management side, and I hope that they can see that then as being an emphasis on my part that this is done properly. Okay, thank you for that, Commissioner. The, um, could you, is there a cost that you can associate with the establishment of the cybercrime unit? That you, I know you've. You're, well, it's on, I, well the, a, a cost can be drawn up for, for staff and, and equipment that could be provided. Yes, yes please, thank you. Um, would you put an approximate cost on the establishment of the, for want of a better description, internal affairs uh, unit that you are proposing to establish by end uh, of year? Uh, yes, again, um, that, that would be primarily um, a staffing cost. Yeah, appreciate that. If you could come back to us on that. Just in relation to the road system that's on trial in Dublin, um, this, this particular um, Deputy Commissioner Toomey, it, how, how does, uh, is it remarkable in the terms of its improvement on the rigidity of the existing system? How long has it been on trial? And do you see there being additional rollouts of it around the country? Or is it is where you have it enough in terms of the ability to determine whether it is an effective change to, to the existing rota system? Um, we're happy that it, it uh, uh, fulfills the role that we want it to fulfill. Uh, it is intended that it will be ro rolled out uh, to the rest, to every other guard of the vision. Um, it probably provides uh, two primary functions, and it relates to the, effect the effective deployment of our resources. So at any one particular time, we have full sight and full line of sight of our existing resources, but it also is a very uh, important planning tool. And we have a lot of, of, of events that are coming up, and we have lots of uh, peaks and troughs in our demand, and it gives us the ability to, to plan more efficiently and effectively for that. And is this, uh, is this an initiative of Commissioner um, uh, Harris, or was, it, or was it something that was planned prior? It, it has been in, 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 in plan right? for, a, for a number of years. Okay. Um, and is a there, lot of is there an additional cost? Uh, this is obviously new software we're talking yes. about. Totally yes, new software. Yeah. There, so it, cost it, that, that, that no doubt has been recorded then in yes. what, 17, 18? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yes. I'm going to try and finish before. Obviously. Understood. Yeah, um, we'll try and finish. Okay. In relation to AMPR, a very interesting conversation you were having with Deputy Aylward. I, one of my questions was whether you were going to be retrofitting exist, existing vehicles. I feel you've kind of answered the question by referencing the reduction in cost and the new vehicles coming in. Uh, but just to touch upon the CCTV element of what Deputy Aylward is referring to in terms of motorways and just general streetscape, um, is AMP or something that Angarda Shiakana would find uh, uh, or would be cost effective or beneficial in the public realm outside of um, vehicle mounted? Is it something that could be retrofitted onto existing traffic cameras, for instance, among, uh, across the, the road network? And uh, is it something that you believe, as I've said, would be beneficial to, to your duties? Um, the, um uh, AMPR does require, you know, a sp specific camera. It just, mm -hmm. you know, you, you cannot uh, operate AMPR just off a, a CCTV system. At the moment. So <laughs> at, 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 at the moment, but it does require a camera to connect to mm -hmm. um, the, the, the appropriate uh, software. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think certainly just when, you, when we look at some of the gangland violence we have and how much of that is actually vehicular driven as well in terms of people driving backwards and forwards and perpetrating serious crime, mm. that, that would be useful. Um, mm. And together then with the considerable effort that we put into the prevention of tax and of burglary, our Operation Thor that we, that, that we run, again, significant. So anywhere where the criminal is using vehicles, like it, it can be of great assistance. Um, it doesn't always have to be a permanent fixture. There are temporary cameras that you can uh, put in place and you use the 4G network then to draw down uh, information from those. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a lot of things we can do, but the legal position seems a little unclear. Okay. Um, and we, and any NPR uh, camera has to be very careful that it doesn't take 
um, an image inadvertently of driver okay. passengers. Um, Chair, I've just three re very quick ones. Um, we, we, I was referring earlier on to put the professionalisation, um, getting officers out from behind desks and out onto the frontline duties. But in terms of recruitment, the, the 600 and the ongoing recruitment to get us to 15,000, as part of your um, new role, Commissioner, diversification of the force obviously is very important. And I don't just mean gender, I also mean race and yes. um, um, background, given, given uh, my own um, constituency and for your uh, information, DMR North. Um, there was 105 nations represented in, in my uh, local authority a few years back. Um, so is that something that you're thinking about in the recruitment process? Is it something that you're actively looking to achieve? Uh, no, I, I, absolutely. And um, I think that's in part been illustrated by the uniform changes that we've brought about. Um, so uh, in, respect, in respect of the hijab and the turban, but also then um, uh, beyond that, I, I think that is illustrative of how welcoming we want to be to the diversification of the organisation. Um, it is important to us because our society has become increasingly diverse and we have to reflect that diversity so that we can keep on enjoying the level of community support and confidence that we presently enjoy. So it, it is critical to us. Um, there's a number of ways into it. It's just not about the sworn officers. They also think about our Guard staff, but also then um, our Guard Reserve. And even then, you know, how we uh, extend ourselves in terms of employing interns for a year as part of the further education type course. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's lots of other things. And, and all of these ways, all of this is just to open up the organisation to the knowledge of more and more people. Because I know if you know nothing about Angarda Shikana, when you look into it, it can seem to be a very mysterious place. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're not sure. We, we just need to be mindful that we're in a very competitive place for talent and employing talent and we need to be doing all we can to promote our, maybe, ourselves. Maybe, maybe the Commissioner, uh, you might, um, uh, in the various responses that you'd be providing to the Committee, no doubt in writing at the later stage, maybe you might indicate to the Committee what sort of um, expenditure the On Guard Shia Khan has, has, has put to the diversification of a guard yeah. it, it, it would be interesting to see what yeah. sort of money you're spending. My last one, I, I, I'm conscious of time, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, and this is by no means a criticism at all of the circumstances, I'm just seeking information, and it's in relation to your transfer in a vehicle from um, Northern Ireland to presumably Garda H headquarters. Yeah. I understand you, you were in a vehicle from, it was a PSNI vehicle. That's correct, yeah. Um, I, I, a genuine question in regards to um, the, the frequency of such um, transfers, um, why you didn't transfer into a, a Garda vehicle, um, where there are firearms on board the PSNI vehicle, for instance. This, I presume this was a close protection vehicle, um, and those most likely did have guard, uh, firearms on board. Is that par for the course in terms of the interaction we have with the PSNI? Um, and, and could you clarify that for me, please? Uh, well, um, uh, if, if I take myself out of this, uh, we have, um, as other police services have, uh, ongoing responsibility for the protection of individuals that would um, visit Ireland. And that, that sometimes involves um, uh, personnel being authorised to carry firearms um, within, the, within the state. And... Uh, so, and, and that has been uh, reported upon in, term, in, in recent weeks as well. So, um, in terms of just uh, my own movements and my own security, uh, there is variety in that, um, and that does require uh, personnel from uh, both organisations at times to cross the border, but I would say um, habitually it's more personnel crossing north. Okay. Um, and just specifically then in relation to the instance in which you were yeah. in, in, in transit. And again, I'm not criticising yeah. here. I just, I'm just only seeking information, and neither is it a pointed remark, Commissioner Harris. Um, but it, it, it was, I presume, a close protection... Yes, a close protection vehicle. vehicle. So they were armed. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, yes. And, and uh, regrettably, I found myself in a position where, well, I've been a subject of some form of threat from some form of terrorist group for... Okay. Um, well many years of my service 
and I'm at the point now where I find I also need um, close protection. So it's an intrusion into my private life, and yes. no one would seek it, but that's where I am. I understand. And Commissioner, I do um, thank you very much for your answers, and I wish you uh, all the very best in, in your role. Thank you. Uh, I know how challenging, uh, no doubt, it will be, but uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you indeed. And Deputy O'Brien. Yeah, and I'll be very brief. Um, because most of the questions have been asked. Uh, just in relation to the training and development budget, Commissioner, for next year, there's a significant decrease um, on the 2018 outcome. I think it was 23.5 million last year, and we're only proposing 11.5 million for 2019. Um, it was on the briefing note that was provided. The second one, I think it's. If I can get it up on the screen. Yeah, this one. So it's uh, A23. Provisional outturn is 23.5 million, and the budget for next year is just 11.5 million. So that's, to me, that's a significant decrease in the training and development budget. And I just wanted to ask some questions on the. And I, first of all, is that correct? That is correct, Deputy. Okay. So I just wanted to ask some questions. Uh, first of all, why is there such a significant decrease in the budget for next year, or well, for this year, 2019, over what was actually spent last year? Was there particular training last year that bumped up that figure? Because even if you look at the 2017 figure, it was over the 20 million as well. We, we certainly had a lot of new systems that, that we were rolling through in, in 2018, Deputy, which explains why there was such a significant increase in, in our training. And would that be the same reason it was, a significant, it was in excess of 20 million as well in 2017? It just seems 2017, 2018 were over 20 million, and then all of a sudden there's a massive decrease of nearly 10 million in the 2019 budget. So I, I think, Deputy, the. the what, what's been referenced here is training and development includes a number of other aspects. Okay. So there are some, some other elements that are not training in, in that sense. So there are um, included in that subhead would be some figures around um, RTA expenses, towing, and so on. So okay. it's, it's as much about that as about raw training. So okay. if it would help the deputy, we could get a more t focused uh, yeah, I mean, note for you on training a, in a, as a strict element. Yeah, if we could just get even the figure on the training side of it, I know there's incidental expenses, but just on the training side, I would like to see whether we're decreasing the training budget in terms of continuous... I, I think we, we, I think we, we uh, uh, a lot of our training is, is equally about um, extraction and, and people uh, moving um, to training, so what we've been trying to do is look at the way in which we are delivering our training, so a far greater focus on e-learning type initiatives okay. um, to avoid the level of, of abstraction that we've seen to date. So the, the changes there are equally reflective of, A, pressures, yes, I mean, we clearly have a lot of systems coming down the line. I'm sure it will feature in our estimates demand for 2020, but equally <coughs> responsibility on our part to address the way in which we go about delivering that training. Okay, I, if you could g just give me a we'll note we'll just on the training element sure, the of training that element budget. We'll do that. Yeah. Um, and just on training, yeah. Commissioner, um, and you may not have the figures today, and if, if you don't, that, that's fine. Because uh, how many of how many members of the force would have safe talk and assist training in suicide prevention? Is it a standard training program that you would run? Or is All our probationers, I think, do something. Yeah. I don't know if there's specific. Sorry, sorry, David. It's, it's been um, uh, supplied to all of our probationers in their training period. Okay. Uh, so that that is in all the recent recruitment. So you you're talking that you know that's up now a couple of thousand um, have been put through that. But we, we can get you a precise number because okay. I, I I know that training in some places has extended beyond the probationers, that's my understanding, so uh, there's, a, there's a further figure that I'll have to obtain for you. Okay, because it's one of my bugbears, and it's not just in relation to Angara Shikana, we have people who deal with uh, the public, whether it's teachers or nurses or members of the force, who don't have that suicide prevention training, and I think yes. it's something that 
everybody who deals with the public, including TDs and senators, should have. Um, and I know the HSC run these courses free of charge, so there's not even an expense on it. There is obviously um, an issue around how we train so many people, but maybe if we could get some figures, I would appreciate that. The other area uh, which is of interest to me is the drug units. Yes. Um, and obviously, we probably deal with drugs in two separate ways. You have your your operational um, issues in terms of dealing with the, the major players in, in it, but you would also have, um, unfortunately, a lot of addicts who would come into contact with uh, Ungarda Shikana, whether it's true, um, you know, they may have uh, they may have drugs on them for personal use, and I think the majority of our drug convictions would be in that category anyway. But the one area which I think in recent years we're seeing more and more is obviously the number of fatalities, uh, particularly from heroin overdoses. Um, and I'm just wondering if, again, the rank and file who would be the people who would be dealing with addicts on a daily basis have any training in um, the provision of um, Narcan or Naxalone for uh, people who, would, who came across somebody who overdosed. Um, they wouldn't have specific training in that uh, in, in, in the, the wider general organisation. Um, Would every squad car have um, an axolorm pack if they came across an overdose? Would they have one on, in the car or close by that? No, the, we, we wouldn't have our people trained okay. in the delivery of, of that and we would be reliant on the medical services. And while our people are trained in some basic uh, first aid, um, they're, they're, they're not trained in, in, in anything more specific. Some of our firearms units uh, and some of our, our national units uh, would have some, some, some further uh, enhanced training. But as a general rule, uh, the principle is that when we come across a medical condition, we, we, we engage the services of, 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 of the HSE. Uh, as they're the professionals in that, in that particular area. And while we have some basic uh, core understanding and core principles, it's the professionals we rely on, and, and that's the way we, we, we base it. And I appreciate that, uh, Assistant Commissioner. But I, I think in some cases, obviously, time is of the essence. Okay. And by the time we ring an ambulance and it arrives, it may be too late. Now, I don't have any figures on the numbers of people who uh, may or may not have been saved. Um, but I do know that in my own area in Cork, we have a number of pharmacies who actually provide the service. They have trained pharmacists within, uh, particularly those who would be um, given out the methadone program. Um, you would see uh, occasionally somebody who would take the methadone within the pharmacy and then uh, overdose outside the door, and the pharmacist would have that training. And I do think maybe at least those um, members of the force who would be on the beat, as we would call it, would have some level of training uh, in that. So I think the more people who were trained in it and the more people who can actually distribute uh, Narcan, um, obviously, you know, benefits the addicts themselves if you do come across an overdose. I think it's certainly something we can, we can take away. Um, it, it's something that our people are always very conscious is uh, the issues and the challenges that the, the people they encounter that they face. I think there is an important demarcation between uh, the role of Angara Shikana and policing and, and that of the health services. And, and it, is, it, it is a balance that we need to be kind of very conscious and careful about. Uh, we can give it some further consideration, but it's something that you know, I think the, the, the professionals uh, in these areas, because it is very specific, mm. uh, I just think it's something we need to give careful consideration about. And, and extending the role of Angari Shiokane into, into this area uh, is something we just... Yeah, and I mean, I'm not asking you to, to give me a, a definitive answer today. I'm just saying maybe it's something that could be considered, yeah, yeah. that there would be you know, a number of Gardaí who would have that experience um, because it could actually save a life at Absolutely. some stage.
as I say, it's something we'll give consideration. Yeah. And I do know that in the likes of the, the Commission report, they talk about critical intervention teams yeah. uh, and greater relation, working relationships between, between the, the professional bodies in, in areas like this. So it's something we can come back to. Okay. The protective service unit uh, within the force, how many personnel would be in that, roughly? Well, it, it, it varies depending on demand. So okay. in some areas... Um, we have upwards to uh, 25 people, uh, and in other areas we have we have we have uh, 12. So we we start off with a uh, a base unit of of, of 12 people, um, and that. But depending on certain areas, uh, where the demand is greater than that, we have extended. We have doubled that, and we have 25 people in it. So it's different on a case by case basis. Yeah. We have it in in a number of guard divisions at the moment, uh, in the region of 10. There's a further seven to roll out this month, and there is a further programme then for all of Garda divisions that to be in place in all Garda divisions before the end of this year. What kind of training would those individuals undertake before being appointed to the PSUs? They, they get very specific training. Uh, there's a training programme designed by the Garda College to ensure that they have uh, all of the skills that they require to undertake the, the functions that they're being tasked with. They also have access to the national unit, which e equally have... Uh, further uh, uh, training in, in, in that area. But it's a very bespoke, specific training okay. uh, programme that they get because they are dealing with the most vulnerable in our society. And the other area is the community policing, uh, the number of uh, community guards, as we would call them locally. Um, is that on the increase or is it decreasing or is it just a, a situation where it's demand led? I mean, because in areas like my own area, they work really, really well, uh, and they work, um, you know, I always say that if you know the first name of your local community guard, then he's doing a good job, um, and thankfully we do know the name of our community guard, but um, would we have a community guard in every area? Well, uh, as part of the division of policy model that has been rolled out, um, we have looked at uh, community policing uh, and the way that, 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 that the role and the function and how that's performed um, and uh, we have provided uh, increased resources in those specific areas but indeed as the organisation is growing it is one of the core principles uh, that, that we have a community policing ethos. Uh, in, in certain cases um, where, where the demand is such that we need people specific and full time in it well, then that is what is provided. But in other areas where it's possible to provide a full range of, of, of uh, services that that, that, that Garda Siakana provide, that, that's done in, in a slightly different way. So it, it, it depends on, on, on the environment where, where people uh, are deployed, but the intention is that there will be a community Garda uh, throughout the entire country, and community policing is a core ethos of the organisation. And you know, you say you, you, you mentioned yourself about working in partnership with people and having developed and built that relationship uh, to to provide the opportunity for our people to engage with local communities in a in a, pro a problem solving type approach. It's not just about Angarshikan; it is about a partnership uh, uh, of, of other agencies and, and, and people. And I think the, the community forums are a yes. classic example of Absolutely. how successful that can Absolutely. be. The other area is obviously guards are human. Um, sometimes we kind of forget that. Uh, and I'm sure that you face the same stresses and pressures as any other member of public. So and in relation to that, how big is mental health issues within the force and is there any counselling provide I, obviously if a guard goes through a very traumatic experience I'm sure there are counselling services put in place uh, to help deal with that but in terms of just general mental health would you provide counsellors if somebody just wanted to speak to somebody yeah. they're feeling depressed um, we, we have a 24-7 um, counselling service available we have employees uh, assistance officer or a staff as well um, uh, who are available um, should um, members be involved in critical or difficult uh, incidents or indeed if, if they just want to outreach 
Um, it's part of our work uh, this year um, in delivering the Commission of Future Policing to further examine our wellbeing strategy mm. for um, all of our employees, both Garda staff and Garda members, to make sure that, that it in effect is um, a, a place which is a healthy place to work. Um, and uh, additional resources then could be made available to the Chief Medical Officer around the staff that he has available to him. Um, and uh, you know, we very much recognise the stresses and strains uh, that, and the toll that it can take both from people professionally and personally, but also on their family as well. And we want to be in a position to offer as much support as we can rather, and prevent being better than the cure in this case yeah. in terms of early support uh, for individuals. Um, and I would agree with that, Commissioner, completely. Is, is it, like, would there be many members of the force would be out sick on mental health issues, just pressures? I don't, I'm not sure if we have the classification by okay. the nature of, yeah. of, of the illness. I don't know if we have that to hand. Okay. But just to echo what, what you both said, uh, and the Deputy, the 24-7 service, the counselling service, is a confidential service provided by an outside party. So people can engage with that and encourage people to engage in that without any knowledge you know, amongst any, including their own colleagues. So it's certainly something, as a service in itself, we would particularly encourage people to use and avail of. But we don't know how many would take are taking up that service. There's, I think the figure that the last figure I saw was about 400 in the you know 400 years. Not a huge number, but I, like given the weekend that's in it, given the darkness into light, um, you know, it, it, it pieces that are going on, events that are going on around the country. I think it's timely again to encourage our ongoing members that the service is there. Mm -hmm. It provides opportunities to have counselling delivered directly to them without engaging with the organisation whatsoever, and we would definitely encourage that to all of our, our staff and members to, to, to go and use the service. Yeah, and I think that would be, as you said, probably a timely reminder to members of the force. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, there are certain types of professions or vocations, such as your own, where people may be uneasy about speaking about yeah. these issues internally yeah. because. Yeah. Whether we like it or not, there is still a stigma attached to mental yeah. health, um, and I'm sure within the guards, that's no different to any sure. other um, that stigma. The vote on has been called. Okay. Um, I just have one last question, so we can finish if, if we want. It's just again, just going back to the drug units, um, are they dependent on? We say the market. So we say in my area in Cork, we have a number of drug units. We have a number of people assigned to that. Does that go up and down based on intelligence? Yes. So, yes. so we have a national unit, and then we have the divisional units. Yeah. And obviously, some areas are of greater demand. Uh, but it has to be said that the, you know the problem of scourge of drugs is right across all of Ireland. So yeah, everywhere has um, a divisional unit dealing with drugs, and it's a very important, critical area uh, for us. Okay, thanks. Deputy Farrell, a quick yeah, question. Mr. Chairman, just a very quick one, Commissioner, in relation to the overtime um, services. One of the questions I skipped over, but it's probably the most important um, in the context of the budget. Um, the, I'm also the chairman of the Rockdale Committee on Children and Youth Affairs, and we, over, we have oversight over Oberstown. And one of the biggest uh, consumers of overtime uh, is the transfer of uh, children on remand or in detention to courts. When in detention, it's on Garda Siakana, and when on remand, it's, uh, it's Oberstown staff. It would occur to me that there has to be a better way of doing that. Yes. And that that is an overtime being incurred by both Oberstown Department of Children and Youth Affairs and Garda Siakana Department of Justice. There has to be a better way of doing it. And I just wanted to highlight it because it was a conversation I had with Pat Bergen, the director of Oberstown in the past, uh, in consultation with uh, Inspector Toomey in Balbriggan. Yes. Um, and I think it's it's one that I would like to just highlight it in this forum for you to, to, to maybe have a, a look at it, because I do think it's important. That there's a better way of doing it that we investigate it and implement it. Well, um, I'm aware of that situation. I'm, I'm aware also that, that, um, that it's been subject to correspondence, so yes. we can ho hopefully provide the up-to-date position. Um, I'm not sure it's entirely appropriate that, that children are in our care, in effect, uh, when in other circumstances they're not. I, you know, I, I'm I, not I sure that's appropriate for us. I agree, and so do Oberstein. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, um,
Commissioner, I'll put a few questions myself um, and we'll try and complete our yes. meeting uh, now in the next few minutes. Okay? Okay. okay. Um, just, just the first question then is, in terms of the peak demand on, your, on the police yes. service during the course of any week or month, is it the usual Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday nights when? Um, or are there on, other times? On, on, on Sunday. And, uh, you know, Sunday is a, a time of peak demand because of the amount of sporting fixtures, okay. etc. And, and Sunday's becoming, you know, a very sociable day, yeah. far more sociable a day than it would have been 20 or 30 years okay. ago as well. So my question is this, how do you match your roster of officers on duty to the peak demand? Like, there's always the question that... Well, well the roster isn't a good match, and that, that's, that's, what, that's what we need to do. The obvious question. Yeah, we need to redesign the roster yeah. so that our, our overlaps are happening at times of that greater demand and actually there's there is a bit of flexibility e even in that so um, e every day being a 10 hour day I think I want some flexibility from that so yeah. some days can be 9 hours so another day may be 11 yeah. that sort but of thing. You, you, I know it's a bit of a cliche but you often hear people saying that Saturday night when there's lots of issues sometimes guards are stretched or and you see plenty on Sunday morning when people are going to church <laughs> you know at half nine you, on Sunday you, you get yes. the point you yes, the roster is yes. Yeah. You get the point. So um, that, that would be the key utilisation of resources. I, I, think the, I think, one, the roster, and two, then, um, some flexibility within the roster. And, yeah. then, and this is, you know, this is all within the reasonable grounds of, of what we can reasonably expect an employee. Um, the yeah. certainty they yeah. should have about the, the duties that are going to be detailed uh, in the weeks in advance. And, okay. you know, I, we want to be a reasonable and good employer. Yeah. At the same time, I have a, a policing yeah. service to provide. Okay. Next question. In general... There's often been reports about the CSO not being able to accept the reliability of, reliability of figures that come from the Garda Sheikh on yeah. various men, and they can't stand over them and they often send them back. Can you send us a note, I think it's the easiest way of, any sets of information that you are currently collecting that the CSO don't, are not satisfied to, to publish in terms of their statistics? You know, okay. it's something we hear about yes. now well, and again, well, uh, and um, it's a possibly the tip of the iceberg. And maybe there are more categories of information that the CSO doesn't put out there because they're not satisfied. It'd be useful to give it to us because this will help you make the case to have whatever requirements yeah, no, are needed I'm, to solve the problem. Yes, absolutely. We'll, we can provide a briefing on that and our endeavours then to make sure that our yeah. our, um, uh, our statistics and and data can be uh, relied upon and, and get the in effect, yeah, because, the mark of the CSO. Yeah, because ultimately, it's not good for anyone if no, people say the police force, we can't rely on their figures or whatever. Like, it's in an effort to bring improvement but, in. Uh, uh, but in fairness to CSO, they, you know, we need to prove to CSO that they can, you know, they can have a high sense of reliability in our figures. Yeah, and in truth, we've had the CSO in here. I think people accept if it comes from the CSO, mm -hmm. there's unanimous widespread yeah. acceptance. and. You know, and, yeah. and it would strengthen your work if it has the Absolutely. CSO stamp on your statistics as well. Next question then, I want to raise a few matters just flicking through the, the accounts before us. The, um, the, it's, uh, it's page 25 of the accounts. It's got to do with compensation and legal costs. And I see during the year in question the compensation award was 9.8 million and the legal costs associated with that, with that were... Um, almost two-thirds of that figure, six million. Now, my big issue is there's a heading there that says civilian claims by members of the public, claims arising from actions of Gardaí in the performance of their duties. There's 196 cases. And the compensation award was 1.8 million, but the legal costs were 2.66. Now, we understand, and we meet it here at the PAC all the time, state claims agency, the costs of the legal costs associated with uh, compensation payments and you know we like to keep the figure as low as possible but it's amazing is there a reason why the legal costs are actually higher than the compensation like who's winning here the legal profession or the principal winner in that one anyway that's and if you're not, if you don't have the specifics of that you can say i, I, don't, I don't have the specifics yeah. definitely but i but i note the comment on certainly we would engage with the state claims agency yeah. around these issues so whether there were particularly large... On that year. Or, or it could have happened, maybe, there's a hangover of legal costs that just landed in that well, year. I don't know. There might be a reason for it. But on the face of it, even... Uh, that, that's the isolated case that looks very bad. But at the end of it, you know, there's over 60% of uh, compensation awards 
you know, there's an over 60% of it, on, on top of that goes on legal costs. Yes. Like it's very yeah, high it in is. comparison to other days. What I don't know, Deputy, I mean, it's quite possible that there might be one, you know, be some very large legal yeah. costs in the middle of that. I don't know. So I don't know, but we'll take that away. You can send us an, an information note on yeah. that. Next time, thing then, and it's on page 13, I'm just curious on this in relation to your accounts, where you have, and this crops up quite a bit, and we've asked it with the HSE, there, there, there's... You've paid six million euro in advance um, for ICT skilled resources payments. Why would you pay so much in I, advance? I think it's, it was capital. It was a capital uh, possibility to enable us to bring forward certain payments while at the same time. So it's consultancy, but it's actually related to the delivery of product, um, and it re reflected slow down in p making other capital payments so within the flexibility provided to us uh, this was one area where we could make some provision and, and make some payments so if there was a slowdown for example in building capital costs which were going to occur early in 2018 yeah. um, it, it within the the allocation that's available to us for for pre for for pre -pre savings that okay. this was dealt with I I'm concerned at that right because you're, you're now making a payment to an ICT company, probably one of the biggest companies in the world, or you know, that don't really need it. And we've seen this. How do we know that we got delivery of that six million euro worth of product when it's prepaid? I know you might say there was a schedule of payments, but I'm just saying the PAC is now getting very concerned with payments across the public service for prepayments and advance payments in relation to ICT projects right across the public sector. And it's not because these companies need it for cash flow purposes. It's probably historic, but there's no great reason why this level... Because ultimately, we've seen it here. Other state organisations have made prepayments, and then the product wasn't delivered, or a company went out of existence, and the prepayment was gone. So there's a risk making prepayments. So I, you know, I, I, know I think yeah. I might ask the CNAG to comment. He's nodding no, in a brief... I mean, there, 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 is, uh, there is that risk, but it is something, and I think... Uh, committee members have pointed it out yeah. before on other accounts as well yeah. and it is typically though part of the pricing model for ICT services okay. um, I, I think it, it's it's generally factored in it's taken into account and it should be uh, reflected in a lower price overall uh, that effectively you're providing the, the working capital and providing the money yeah, you in might send, You might send us a note on just that 6 million to know because that was 2017 was that sure. I, Whatever was well, contracted for, delivered and received. No, I can absolutely confirm, without knowing the specifics of it, that all of the systems that we worked on at the time either okay. have been delivered or continue, they continue to work on. But I'm happy, Deputy, to our chair to come back to you. Yeah, you can just send us the note because it's an issue that's cropped up several meetings. Sure. Yeah. Okay, it's not specific to you, yeah. right? Other issue then is uh, probably it might require legislative change, and maybe that might be the answer. But like, one can't be. Always has to remark, if you go into your local district courts, you'll see 20 Gardaí there, you know. Um, is, there, is it not possible to what I would call the station sergeant to be the one that's able to give the evidence on behalf of all the members instead of having 20 members, you know, standing up, lining up? And just while I'm on the district court, I've said this year, previous years, one of the best um, value for money of any section anywhere in the state organisation is the amount paid to your inspectors who present the cases in your district courts around the country. They could have dozens and dozens, is it, inspectors, haven't yes. they, the right grade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They get a small allowance for the extra work, yeah. and they, you, you could see during the course of the day, they'd have 50 or 100 cases, and right. 10 different solicitors coming and going, and this one inspector is able to handle every single one of them. I'm just saying, it's a tribute. It's, you know, if that had to be, if you had to, that service had to be uh, provided by the matching legal service that the defence has would be into millions all over the place. It's a tremendous efficient system and I'm sure it's good training for the inspectors to understand the thing. But I suppose my real question then is, can anything be done in terms of utilisation of your manpower, not to have them sitting in court? You know, the speeding fines, the speeding offences, the... Well, you know, that, that is um, that's part of the work that... Uh, uh, John Toomey's taken on my behalf just what is our obligation to go to court and can actually one member be able to in effect lift a number of cases yeah. and be able to successfully then be there and and do whatever is needed in terms of presentation and sometimes it's quite limited in, in effect so um, 
we, we want to look at that because that is a drain on our resources. Okay, you can send us a note on that. Yes. And if it's a if there's a legis legislative reason why it can't be done, well then it's our fault yeah. rather okay. than your, your yes, responsibility. Okay. So it's yeah. just to make it's just to clarify the issue. Now this will always uh, people find curious. Um, on page 21, you, you received an income of 80, 3,000 euro really as commission for collecting insurance premiums on behalf of insurance company. Why is that car insurance, sir? Like, why are the guards collecting insurance premium for insurance companies? Like, this is here every year, it's not. I just don't get it why the Gardaí are collecting insurance companies and what was the total amount collected and what was the Garda's commission, the Garda Shia Connick. And what's the, why does that happen? Well, then we're into a detailed note. We'll have to come back on that. Yeah, yeah we're happy that. to. Yeah. But we'll it's, jump, it's jumping one, out at me. Yes, okay. Maybe somebody was charged with not paying their insurance and they handed in the money to the Garda to pay off. I don't know. But it looks. Uh, it's actually there every year, so it's, a, it's an unusual one. That's income received by Angarda Shikana. Income received by Angarda Shikana um, in the middle of that page. So you can come back to us with a note of that. Then I also see, just talk to me, do you provide um, escorts for movement of cash between the banks? There was a time there used to be, you used to be paid a lot of money. Maybe you're not doing it anymore, or yes, are you doing it? Who's doing it now? Is it G? The, the, the process changed. Yeah. Uh, Previously, it, it was a specific function. No, it's on a more case by case. There's a different process in place. But you don't pay, charge for it anymore. No. So why are the banks getting this service free from the taxpayer to protect their money when they used to pay for it a couple of years ago? Um, I know you say there's public interest. Make sure the money isn't stolen in case it makes its hands into the wrong place. I, um, it, it's quite a, quite a limited de deployment on our part. At this stage. At, at this stage. Okay, it's reduced. It, yes. Okay. Uh, such as the. Uh, and it's reduced through the application of technology in fairness by the, by the money transit firms. Okay. So, you, you know, there's far more technology that they've brought to bear in terms of protection of the cash. And, okay. and it, it has pretty much got rid of the, uh, the need for our involvement. Uh, you know, obviously there was some concern, yeah. but that would be concern would probably be around, you know, a specific a threat issue, or intelligence issue, that yeah, we might have. Issue. Okay. Yeah. Two, two, two last questions. You did mention the interaction with the OPW. Um, and I got the impression from you that some of the small things you might prefer, you know, if a door breaks in a Garda station, does the OPW have to come and fix it? What? I think just there makes, so we have small we have small allocations at station level where people can do some very minor works. Yeah. The OPW provides some of that as well. I think, in, in the context of the conversation with with Deputy Kelly earlier on, I think where we get into difficulty is where the money sits in one part. It doesn't matter where it is, and responsibility to do, the delivery of the service sits elsewhere. So whether that sits on our side or whether it sits on the OPW, really the money should follow the activity, and I think that's where, where I, I would recommend we, we, we look to. Okay, one minor thing, you can send me a note on this, and you'll smile at me. The canine unit, the dog unit, right? Yeah. I've had a series of PQs to OPW and Garda Shia or the minister on this. I understand you have a policy of trying to home um, the dogs yes. in the house, the properties of yeah. their handlers, so they have a good relationship. Yes. Yeah, and I've been following this for a year or two now, um, and the OP, the department had approved the thing, E'd approved it, OPW, now I'm told the cost per OPW for what one would have thought was a minor issue is quite an expensive issue. I know they have to do whatever they have in the people's property. And, and really, I'm now told OPW are, are back starting. You did one or two, OPW did one or two. But you can just send us a note on current I can update you here, Deputy. Pardon? Because I can update you now. Oh, well, I'm delighted to hear it. <laughs> I hope your members of the K9 unit are listening now. No, they are, because they've been ultimately also the last few days. So. Right, okay. um, no, we, we, we've, we have looked at the nature of the similar kenneling arrangements that are used by other services, so the Revenue Commissioners, for example. Yeah. And um, we have sourced an approach and through bulk buying will be able to significantly reduce the amount, the costs associated with the provision of those kennels. So we'd be all pleased to hear we will be able to roll out additional kennels uh, to, to dog own, or to dog handlers this year. So that's all in hand and it's all been sorted. Okay. So with the assistance of the OPW and some work we did ourselves, we've, we've, we've resolved the matter. Okay. Last question, you send me a note, and like everyone else, I have an interest. Uh, Nishafleet Division Garda Headquarters, send us a note on 
in relation to the building, I know they're proposing for a major extension to the divisional yeah. headquarters in Port Leash. So you can, I won't delay the meeting. Okay. You can just send that on in right. Uh, just Thank an update. You. So at this stage, uh, we're completed our meeting. So I want to thank Commissioner Harris and your officials and officials from the Department of Justice and Public Expenditure, and also the CNAG and his staff um, for their, your attendance here today. And it's agreed to, that the. the Clerk will seek any follow-up information and carry out any agreed actions arising from today's meeting that's agreed, and will now adjourn until the 16th of May, when we will be resuming our examination in relation to the financial statements of the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.